All right, we got the man of all hate, the one and only BSP. Darkside Phil is proof that you can make a living as a professional gamer, even if you're awful at gaming. But that's far from the only thing he's awful at. From constantly failing to deliver on promises made to his audience, to outright treating them like trash. So, I've had enough excuses. It just seems to me like people are fucking lazy and don't want to come out to the streams. All while begging them to pay his bills. With the taxes coming up in April and everything, there's gonna probably be times where I'm gonna have to appeal to you guys again to try to save my butt. If spitting on a plate you ate from was an Olympic sport, Phil would be a gold medalist, though he would probably sell the gold medal to finance his tax problems and feed his mobile game addiction. This is the two decade spanning story of the self-proclaimed king of hate, Dark Side Phil. Born on April 6, 1982, Philip Paul Burnell grew up on the outskirts of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Quite opposite to his life after becoming an online personality, very little of his early years have been documented. One of the very few stories that has stood the test of time is that of a young Phil going to a comic book store with his parents and asking them for a rare $25 Wolverine toy for his birthday, claiming that he never asked them for stuff, which, given the behavior pattern we later come to know as Phil's MO, it's very unlikely this is the case. When they take too long to buy it and the store runs out of stock for that particular toy, he berates them and seeing how amped he still gets when retelling the story, it seems he still resents them for this. So my birthday came and passed, and guess what? My parents go, we're very sorry, Philip, but we couldn't find the action figure. I said, I told you to buy the figure. Why don't you listen to me? If we can take his word for it, he graduated from Catholic school, St. Ambrose, in 2000 as the valedictorian of his class before going on to study business at Fairfield University. But before studying business, DSP was already getting busy in the competitive fighting game scene with a particular interest in Capcom's Street Fighter series. In the 90s, he actually traveled across the United States to attend tournaments. Mind you, this is at a time when gaming was still seen as somewhat of a loser thing to be engaged in. So to be dedicated to it as much as he was, was pretty pretty rare. However, this dedication didn't manifest in exclusively positive ways. Phil often lost his temper and was a generally toxic player, which turned many of the other attendees of the tournaments he participated in against him. Now when I go to these tournaments, I say, hey guess what, such and such, I've known you for 10 years, get the fuck off this station because I want to play the game. And usually, when you threaten them like that, they get the fuck up because none of them want to fight. <laughs> none of them want to step outside and get their ass beat. What's worse is that for many years, despite his dedication to the point of toxicity, he consistently lost every single tournament he was in. For a while, that was true. I was one of the biggest shit talkers in the Street Fighter community. And I would go to tournaments and I would lose. And that's embarrassing. As he tells the story, when he finally turned this around and started winning, it was to the general chagrin of everyone involved, which earned him the title of the King of Hate, because everyone hated him. The competitive fighting game community by 2005 had largely made the transition from the use of arcade cabinets to console ports. Evo 2005, however, proved to be a bump in the middle of that transition. A PlayStation port of Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo was particularly divisive in the fighting game community, with various bugs and technical details that would mar its reputation. The the port fell so far short of minimum expectations due to the differences in this particular port that, as a result, various high-level players would end up boycotting the event in protest to its use. While they went high, however, Phil went low. On his credit score, to be more specific, in perhaps the earliest manifestation of his ability to handle his finances in anything resembling a mature way, a 23-year-old Phil was living in a three-bedroom apartment he knew he was going to move out of within half a year. In the meantime, he had no idea how he was going to pay his bills, let alone find and pay for another place to live in. With his only job prospect being an entry-level position at a Best Buy, Phil applied his business diploma to the best of his abilities. Instead of buckling up and being frugal, hoping to scrape by until his conditions improved, he decided to take cash advances on every Every single one of his credit cards, which ended up being about $3,000, so that he could travel to and attend Evo. This decision mangled him financially so bad that he spent the next five years only managing to pay off the interest. Was it worth it? Well, he placed not third, not second, not first, but fourth in the tournament. However, since the top three players were all Japanese, Phil rearranged this win to mean he was the best American player, exclusively because it has a nicer ring to it, since there's no real reason to separate players based on their nationality. This gets even sillier when when you consider that he's acting like this tournament somehow represented the entire country, which instantly falls on its face when you take into account the fact that many American players didn't participate due to their issues with the port. Other people in the community picked up on DSP, and they didn't take his comments about this event very kindly. You got some, That's the answer I was looking for. You got some idiot named DSP who's a total piece of <laughs> shit, by the way. 
I like to I like to get that on YouTube. But but this guy thought he was hot because he beat me and Choi in a game that was like it's like a Neo Geo conversion of Street Fighter or some crap, dude. <laughs> This may seem like a minor issue, but it's less about the tournament itself and more about how Phil himself behaved afterwards. In later videos, he belittles the other player's issues with the port, saying that they shouldn't have expected arcade-like gameplay from a console, and instead should have practiced more. Instead, we said instead of being about it, which is what it seemed all the OGs were doing, we'll just play the game and learn the differences so we know for the tournament. Being a sore loser is bad, but not content with just that, Phil managed to also be a sore winner, because even after he started winning tournaments here and there, he continued to make everyone around him dislike him by behaving like a buffoon for no reason. While there is a video of Phil doing things like loudly and obnoxiously talking over people he was playing with, it seems he was self-conscious enough to keep the more egregious displays of his lack of self-control and respect for others to behind the scenes. In one instance, in 2002, he pushed the limits so much that, while he was leaving the place he was playing at, him and his friends were followed by the friend group of someone he'd recently lost to, who proceeded to compel him to pay a nominal amount of money for being a general nuisance. According to Justin Wong, another avid Street Fighter player whom DSP had beat before, he had the tendency of being nice to him in person and saying terrible things about him when he wasn't around. However, the most detailed account of why exactly DSP had such a terrible reputation in the community came from another fellow Street Fighter player, Viscant. His Reddit post reads as follows. This would have been either EVO 2005 or EVO 2006. Phil had been talking trash for weeks slash months before I finally got sick of it. I'm pretty sure I challenged him to a money match and knew he wasn't going to accept and was going to be like, lol, fight me IRL at EVO, and I accepted from here, it turns into what sounds like a total farce, except I can assure you that it was 100% serious, which makes us both look like total, complete idiots. So first, Phil was like, okay, well you have to sign some document because if I kill you, I don't want to be responsible. And I was like, whatever. Then there was an actual serious negotiation over who the ref was going to be, but I don't remember this part either. Then there was an honest to God negotiation over weight and that we were going to have to weigh in and everything. Again, I'm not making any of this up. As dumb as this sounds, this absolutely happened. Finally, it was agreed that he wouldn't have to go on a diet to fight me and it was settled that we were going to fight. It was going to have MMA rules. It would have a referee and we'd sign waivers. I was dumb in the mid 2000s. Anyway, so we agreed upon this early in the year and from here on is where the story gets weird. So apparently Phil was under the impression that this wasn't going to happen and that this was just internet shit talk, but a few people from the west coast went out to one of the east coast tournaments and told him that I was taking this seriously and was going to fight him, and had probably been in more gym fights in the past two months than he'd been in in his life. So one day Phil instant messages me on AIM and tries to back out. He was like, hey, so how about this? How about we pretend like we're going to fight, and then when a whole crowd is around us, we both do DX cross chops to the crowd. It'll be such a goof. This really happened, and I'm just like, are you f***ing kidding me? I honestly couldn't believe he was pulling this, and I was still mad about the whole thing, and actually wanted to fight him. I told him I wasn't going to do any of that trolling, but if you want to drop it, then fine, I'll drop it. We can both be adults about this. And that's pretty much what happened. I'm not going to jump him from behind in the parking lot, or get in his face and threaten him. From that point on, there never really was any problem between him and I. In fact, the next year, when Evo West was in San Diego, I let him stay at my place that year, and when Mike Watson and Jaha were about to kill him in a parking garage, I stepped between them and defused that situation. He later would go on to have more serious problems with Watson and Jaha, but I made sure it wasn't going to happen when he was staying with me. I generally don't hold grudges, so even though I remember being really pissed off at the time, by the time the parking garage thing happened a year later, I was over it. The parking garage situation Viskin is referring to is the aforementioned shakedown, but enemies weren't the only thing Phil made in his time as a competitive Street Fighter player. He also made some friends. However, however unlikely that may seem, and they went on to collaborate with him in the future. One such acquaintance was Mr. John Rambo, who sought Phil out after his victory at EVO because he wanted to get better at Super Street Fighter Turbo. He'll come up again later, so keep that guy in your mind. Despite his infamy and localized gaming communities IRL, Phil found a way to circumvent this by tapping into the realm of online gaming. Even if word got around about his excesses at the competitions, it wouldn't be enough to prevent him from making a name for himself based exclusively on what he chose to put up online. He created a YouTube channel in 2007, where he uploaded uploaded random vlogs related to his interest in competitive gaming, but in 08, he slowly transitioned the channel into a rudimentary proto Let's Play channel, though instead of having the screen captured directly while he played it, he recorded it with a separate device, meaning he pointed the camera at the TV, basically. At the time, Phil lived with his parents and saw content creation as a pastime rather than a job. Not that content creation was much of a job option in the Jurassic period, which was YouTube prior to the 2010s, but even still, he was somewhat realistic about his expectations. Still, that didn't stop Phil from taking inspiration from one of the early internet's most adored legends, Angry Video Game Nerd. Now, as I was a, a Street Fighter player, I used to travel with a group of friends, and it was actually in a hotel room at a Street Fighter tournament where we were just hanging out and having fun 
and one of my friends said, did you ever see this guy called the Angry Video Game Nerd? I was like, no, I don't know who that is. I never, you know, and they showed me a video of this guy who looked like, like very much dressed up like a nerd, right? He had a button down white kind of shirt, gla thick glasses, right? Even talked kind of a little bit high pitched or whatever. And here he is ranting at a video game, making funny lines, talking over the top, swearing like a sailor. Hilarious. No production values, no budget to it, just him and a camera making fun of a video game. Though I get what he's saying, there is a kind of purity and earnestness to early YouTube Kino, and I use that word loosely because I'm pretty sure AVGN was on another site before he was on YouTube, but I digress. I think Phil took the no production value part a little too seriously. He took pride in posting playthroughs in bulk, with several hours of video dedicated to each game with absolutely no editing involved. On this decrepit, old, and abandoned channel, there are over 7,000 videos, because back then, you couldn't upload very long videos, compelling Phil to split them up into dozens, if not hundreds of individual 10 minute clips. Again, I should remind you, we're not talking about Bandicam or unregistered Hypercam here. We're talking about actual camera footage with built-in microphone audio capturing all of it, completely raw, untreated, unedited whatsoever. Unsurprisingly, the channel didn't exactly blow up overnight. So unsurprisingly, Phil is proud that he spent three years of his life doing this for no money and actively derided other content creators who only started doing gaming videos after they began being monetized on the platform. Mind you, this man is 28 years old and living with his parents and somehow he thinks it's a merit that he makes no money out of playing video games alone with no one watching. On top of that, he brags about the passion and effort he put into the videos and his larger upload volume compared to these other, much more successful creators, when in reality, he just has the most videos precisely because of how awfully low effort they are. It's a perfect example of quantity over quality. Once again, it's not what DSP is doing that's the issue, it's that he brags about it in a really grating way while putting others down. Oddly enough, Phil's first conflict with someone else to be documented online wasn't a result of him disrespecting respecting other YouTubers for trying to make money off of their content. Instead, it was during a recording of his playthrough of Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions when he was making too much of a racket and his neighbor decided to interject. Being the good Samaritan he is, Phil took his neighbor's advice. As it turns out, however, his neighbor wasn't the only person getting annoyed at Phil. The running jokes surrounding DSP's online presence actually had a running start, as they were already going on before he had enough detractors, and people in general, seeing his content in order to pick up on it. Though if you are to go back and look at these older uploads, you can catch them in the wild. For example, Phil claimed he suffered from a chronic nasal drip, and because of this, he also chronically snorted loudly into the microphone. Later on, in part due to his tendency to ask for money, this take of Phil's got him compared to pigs many, many times. Another focal point for his haters was his loudness, which his neighbor can corroborate, but specifically his laugh, lovingly dubbed the seal laugh due to its ASMR tier exquisite sound design. <laughs> But let's be fair here, regardless of how entertaining or irritating these may be, they're most likely done unconsciously by Phil. This is just how he is, he had no choice. However, what he has chosen is to be the real-life incarnation of a character from South Park, as he made a series of videos dedicated exclusively to cataloging his funniest racist <laughs> remarks while gaming. Many people's careers get decimated when they have one racist remark revealed to their audience, but Phil is such an absolute based unit that he himself compiles and posts his own expose material. Around the same time he started putting more effort into uploading to his YouTube channel, he was also hired into a job as a customer service phone operator for a company called Aftermarket Support for Helicopters, though sometimes he refers to it as HSI, which means Helicopter Support Incorporated. According to Phil's retelling, he constantly worked extra hours and was paid less than other people who did the same job as him, despite the company's actual vice president telling them he was better than his customer service position and that he was to undergo extensive training for a promotion into what sounds like a general managerial role. He supposedly did all this training training while remaining a customer service employee, which he described as equivalent to working two jobs simultaneously. After two years of this, he was temporarily taken out of his customer service position and placed into that managerial position. And if his word is to be trusted, he revamped the entire company and started saving them a lot of money. And his work was so excellent that they gave him an award. The only problem was his work was so excellent, in fact, they no longer had any use for him. And within two months of giving him this award, they laid him off. Does this sound fishy to you at all? Because it sounds like the Pacific Ocean to me and to many other people as well. 
Well, though we only have Phil's side of the story, it's not that difficult to glean a very different one from simply looking into it. For starters, his last job was at Best Buy, and the story with it is also very interesting. Phil claims that he was the leader of a business team and was paid better than everyone else, and that the leadership at Best Buy hated him because he made too much money. Again, this story is basically that he was so good at his job, there was no reason for the business team, which he was the leader of, to exist, and because they couldn't just fire him, they framed him for violating Best Buy's discount policy. That, or he did indeed get fired for violating Best Buy's discount policy, but I'll let you decide which is more likely. If only they reduced his pay instead of framing him, they would have found out that Phil is willing to be underpaid and work multiple jobs at the same time. Anyway, this is just a segue to the question, how did he get a job at a helicopter support company? The answer is deceptively simple. His dad. As a former logistics coordinator for HSI put it, there was a significant culture of being rewarded in accordance to who you know rather than what your work affects. Presumably, Phil heard these kinds of complaints from his more blue-collar workers and decided to pretend he was one of them, but the truth was precisely the opposite. His father, David, worked at the company as a customer support manager from 2005 to 2007, later being promoted to logistics manager and finally, continuous improvement leader, which is noteworthy since this is the exact phrase Phil uses when describing his job and training at the company. It instantly becomes clear that David, having achieved a reputable position in the company, had his son hired as the position he used to occupy. The highest likelihood is that Phil simply transplanted his dad's achievements onto himself. Unlike Phil, his dad is an extremely experienced and highly skilled person, a former Marine with GPAs north of 3.7, along with a bachelor's, two masters, and one PhD, all related to quality management. His stint managing HSI was just an extension of his already decades-long business relationship with its parent company, Sikorsky Aircraft. Having begun as a mere shop technician and being promoted all the way up to an elite position before becoming his own boss and opening a company of his own. The job he passed down to his son wasn't an entry position, it was something he worked up to for three decades. So it's no wonder Phil couldn't fill his shoes even a little bit. All of this becomes particularly egregious when later on in his career, Phil punctuates this story with his complaints and grievances about how corporate America is mean and exploitative to poor little blue collar workers like him. When he was literally a nepotism hire, the whole being thoroughly trained for an elite position story also disintegrates once Phil makes the mistake of showing the award he got during a stream. As it turns out, the award for his amazing work was, in fact, simply a certificate that he had completed something called ACE Certification Program, which, by doing cursory research into the company, is something that tens of thousands of people go through at HSI, and not a special program he was assigned to by the vice president himself. In any case, his delusion about his job at HSI is so great that he actually believes that him being laid off caused the company to go out of business. At that helicopter company I worked for, within a few years, years of me getting laid off, they, they went out of business. Another very conveniently underexplained wrinkle in this story is the detail about him buying a condo so that he could live closer to the job. And I paraphrase, be the guy that shows up during a snowstorm when everyone else doesn't. The problem with his Hustlers University tier motivational grind begins with the fact that he bought a condo while being supposedly severely underpaid. However, the real crux of the condo story comes when you find out that based on the intentional self docs Phil gave out in a video tour of his condo and the public records of his dad's address, which are not going to be specified for privacy reasons, it was less than a 10 minute drive from his parents' house. He already lived near his job. All his move did was shave off a mere five minutes from the total commute, meaning he bought a $130,000 condo because he wanted to buy one. More avid followers of DSP have added to the in-depth analysis of his condo shenanigans, saying that part of Phil's motivations for buying property so close to his parents was so he could just go back to their house to get meals and his clothes washed due to him being too much of a man-child to do those things himself. And to be honest, um, I actually agree with that lifestyle choice because I am a man baby and I refuse to do anything. Last but not least, it's claimed he at one point admitted to buying the condo from a girl he worked with in hopes of getting with her, only to be notified she had a boyfriend after the deal was closed. However, a lot of the original Dark Side Phil uploads have been privated or otherwise unavailable through regular means, so these footnotes have yet to be verified. But regardless of the whys and hows, despite his father's best efforts, Phil once again found himself unemployed, and it was during this period that he decided to pursue content creation full-time, and his hobby turned into his profession. There was only one pesky little issue with this plan. Phil had his AdSense account preemptively disabled for directly begging for his audience to click on the ads that appeared on his videos, something that went against the terms and conditions of the standard AdSense contract. Please go to my partner channel, The King of Hate HD, and click on the ads that show up on the videos there because hopefully, you know, fingers crossed. Phil would later try and distract people from this fact by saying that the real reason his AdSense was suspended was due to a video of his being so successful, YouTube thought he was cheating. I made this video of me in the shower topless scrubbing my body, basically slurring my words because I had drunk, drank so much, all right? Uh, it went viral. Within a day, the thing had something like 30,000 views, if not more. 
Um, and honestly, because I was making so much, you know, I, there was there were ads on it, and people were, were going crazy for the ads. I made like a thousand bucks in a day on that video, which is out of control, right? But that video got so much attention. Guess what? That was the video that triggered YouTube seven plus years ago to think that I was cheating with the AdSense program. And they contacted me and said, we're kicking you out of the AdSense program on this channel because we suspect that you're that you're you're, you're sitting there clicking on the video to get ad revenue because you made so much in one day. And I was like, I didn't. It was the viewers. The viewers went nuts for this crazy video and probably went over and went, oh, I want to support Phil, the underdog. He just lost his job. Let's all click on the ads or whatever, which you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to do that on YouTube. No, you're not supposed to ever try to ask, uh, uh, have someone click on ads or anything. It's supposed to be of their own free will. So YouTube falsely accused me of doing this myself that sounds very very real <laughs> in the very same breath he lets it slip that he asked for people to click on the ads confirming that this was the violation in question before proceeding to haphazardly justify it this wasn't the only blow phil suffered as a series of playthroughs he was in the process of completing were being uploaded to his channel for the game splinter cell conviction he got copyright striked which made the original dark side phil channel screech to a halt in response to this he created dsp gaming his longest running and currently still active main channel even after the original channel was reactivated when YouTube decided the copyright claims were indeed false. Since his AdSense account was still not working, the prospect of being a professional gaming content creator on YouTube was still squarely outside of Phil's purview. So he went to another website, which at the time was one of YouTube's main competitors, Blip.tv. Blip was considered laxer on copyright issues, hence why creators like Nostalgia Critics Doug Walker also re-uploaded their content there. However, Phil's time on Blip was very short, as the more relaxed terms of service made him a little too comfortable. How comfortable? Well, he decided to roleplay as the last remaining Nazi during a playthrough of the game Dead Space 2, saying that every enemy he killed in game was Jewish. This is what happens when you let the Jews do whatever they want. <laughs> You've let the Jews overrun space, and now look at this. Their greed has had the artifact turn everyone into necromorphs. <laughs> Despite being the second biggest creator on it at the time, this probably lost him his partnership with Blip, leaving him bereft and upset that he wasn't given a chance to redeem himself by the platform. Just in the nick of time, however, came Machinima, who offered him a chance to bypass his AdSense troubles by having the money come into their account. For the sake of full disclosure, an often forgotten about fact is that this wasn't the first opportunity he had to partner with Machinima. The first time a contract was being negotiated was back in 2010, but Phil ruined it by first demanding his videos be featured once a week on Machinima's channel, and when his demands were rejected, he made a video trashing the company for unrelated, and according to Hutch, made up reasons. But a year later, Machinima overlooked it and foolishly decided to take him on anyway. On top of that, they would also protect him from any potential copyright issues he may face. Just like that, DSP was back to brute forcing his YouTube success by uploading a massive volume of videos until one of them happened to get a lot of views, much like he used to do on the original DSP account. Alongside the gameplay videos, he had other segments such as Ask the King Q&A, The Week in Preview, which I suppose covered DSP-related news, and the most notorious DSP Tries It, where Phil would, as the name suggests, try new things of all varieties. Eventually, it was cancelled, however, due to the negative effects it was having on his health due to how often the trying involved eating extremely unhealthy fast food. Despite the very rocky road he took to get to this point, Phil finally approached something resembling stability, and even a fan base who tolerated his attempts at humor and the incessant burping and snorting straight into the microphone. Okay, that's a little facetious. The Dead Space thing was, was honestly pretty funny. If you were to scroll through the comments on his condo tours from 2011, people were genuinely happy for Phil, many even living vicariously through him, wishing they had an entire condo to be their man cave full of gaming memorabilia. For every person annoyed by Phil, there were many more that enjoyed watching him. There was a moment in time in which it could be said the general audience wanted to like him, and there was a reason to be optimistic for the future of Darkseid Phil, but nobody could predict how fast this reputation would sour. Hey worthless humans, if you worked on this part of the game, you're a worthless human. In the early 2010s, Google reformed its AdSense system, and now, it rewarded viewer retention instead of sheer numbers of views. Essentially, the longer someone watches your video, the better. Just getting a click is not enough to make as much money as someone who gets people to stick around on their video for an hour. This was an issue for Phil since he had a penchant for splitting his videos up into dozens of little tidbits, rarely cracking 10 minutes, often being as short as two. He also refused to improve the technical aspects of his content despite how much money he had already made out of it and how many of his actual legitimate fans were begging him. By 2011, PewDiePie was already soaring to insane heights of popularity with relatively good quality, a decent mic, and even a face cam, setting a new standard for gaming content, while Phil was still languishing with his busted camera filming his screen with little to no editing to speak of. 
The problem became more and more inflamed as time went on, and Phil's viewers let him know that if he wasn't interested in evolving his format, they would move on to newer and better channels than his, to which he either responded with derision, a ban from his channel comments, or both. In short, DSP made it clear he didn't want to treat YouTube like it was, his job and his only source of income. You know, two years ago, it was about me, you know, waking up, putting my camera down whenever the hell I felt like it, recording for a few hours and uploading the footage to YouTube. Now, it's about having a schedule. Every day, getting up, whether I feel good or not, plopping down on the couch, setting up, live streaming on a schedule so you guys can watch live, then trying to figure out how to schedule out uploads. It actually, I'd say this, it's actually more work at this point doing what I'm doing because it is more like having a regular job. You know, every day I'm trying to do two streams because that's the kind of dedication that I put towards this effort. So, you know, being having sitting down, streaming for several hours, uploading videos, streaming a second stream, babysitting the videos, setting them up for uploads, putting them into playlists, tweeting, keeping you guys in the know. It's a lot of work versus what I used to do. Very rarely do you get this clear of an admission of laziness. He often bragged about how much money he made off of his channel, but clearly it wasn't enough for him to hire an editor, get a capture card, or basically anything that would improve the experience for the viewer. The viewer being the reason he gets any money in the first place. And if that weren't enough, even in hindsight he sees nothing wrong with his attitude and actually blamed the negative responses he was getting on people being envious of how much money he was making. Due to his plummeting popularity and, concomitantly, his depleting AdSense revenue, Machinima sought to reevaluate his contract, renegotiating various areas of their partnership. Particularly, the amount Phil was paid for pumping out his content slop was under heavy scrutiny, since Machinima was receiving a lot less from advertisers. It seems that this renegotiation talk finally lit an ember under Phil's ass and got him to at least try and do different things than his usual stick. One of these things was a series called Project 7, which was purportedly made based on suggestions from Machinima and his fan base. I know this era of YouTube, and particularly content adjacent to AVGN, and Nostalgia Critic, which this definitely was, is typically cringy and corny, and that's that's part of the appeal, but I think this was cutting it a little bit close. That's right, and you'll never escape my clutches. <laughs> That's just me being a hater though, because alongside with this panel at MAGFest 2012, Project 7 was one of the very few instances of genuine positivity surrounding Phil's come up. And for a very brief period, it was almost as if he wasn't completely phoning it in for the money. However, despite Project 7 looking good on Phil's resume and giving his channel the appearance that he was indeed putting in an effort, the stories surrounding it behind the scenes were dismal. In an hour and a half long video that eventually came out in 2015, only to be taken down by Phil due to it being a PR nightmare for him, his friends, John Rambo, and Howard, with whom he did Project 7, told the truth about how it was made. Mind you, this wasn't initiated by John and Howard, but by Phil himself, who, when asked about the rumors of the two no longer being friends with him, said that real men discussed their problems and suggested that the only feasible explanation for their falling out is that they were jealous of him, as Phil tends to do. All of the videos of Project 7, which heavily relied on editing and storyboarding, were produced by two childhood friends of Howard's, Andre and Paul, who ran the YouTube channel Respect the Pact. As a matter of fact, they were the ones who had the idea for Project 7, and only brought Phil in, presumably because he was looking for ways to branch out with his content. Initially, Phil being the face of it meant that their work would get more eyes on it than usual, which is a good thing. However, they quickly realized Phil wasn't exactly someone who exhibited good faith. For starters, the editing and special effects, which again were the brunt of the series, was taking up a lot of Andre and Paul's time, especially since Andre was about to become a father. This prompted John to tell Phil to pay them for their efforts, to which Phil replied he had already offered to do so, and they'd turned it down. This turned out to be a bold-faced lie, which was instantly revealed once John mentioned it to them. Apparently, Phil had every intention of keeping every proceed from Project 7 to himself and wanted to share it with absolutely no one. And before you think this is because of machinima renegotiations or what have you. During the production and publishing of the show, Howard noticed that Phil bought a plethora of expensive man-baby gamer toys, which he's known for decking his house out with. And if that isn't enough to invoke a sense of injustice, a BMW. Notwithstanding, everyone involved in the series contributed out of their own pocket to produce and sell merchandise for it, but only Phil ever saw any of the resulting revenue. The pettiness on Phil's part was so extensive that he didn't even tolerate positive comments about the other participants in Project 7. Upon seeing John Rambo's contributions to the show be considered funnier and 
and better perform than his. Phil rushed to claim that everything, including their lines, was his idea when they were not. They confronted him about it, and he apologized, but according to John in particular, Phil's apologies meant very little. Over the course of their friendship, Phil tended to either make a slight or tell a lie about John, apologize when confronted, only to do it again a while after. Ultimately, this is why their friendship broke down. They simply lost all faith that Phil could listen and care about what actions of his made his pretty much only friends uncomfortable or upset, and gave up on interacting with them altogether. Eventually, in 2022, Phil claimed that the reason no payment was made to them for their work on the project was due to the fact that, indeed, the project was losing money. Even if this was the case, and who knows, there's a fair chance it was, he could have just communicated that to them. The fact that he didn't talk about the project failing until 10 years later is at least a little bit suspicious, I guess. Just a little. While the seeds were being sown for the disintegration of Phil's relationship with his friends, he was beginning a new relationship with someone else. Leanna, also known as Panda Lee Games, or just Panda Lee. Immediately, people took issue with the fact that Phil was 30 years old while Leanna was born in 1993, meaning in 2012, she would have been 19 turning 20. Since Phil's life was indistinguishable from his content at this point, since he would spend most of his waking hours doing something or other to contribute to the pumping out of more content, Leanna coming into his life meant that she was bound to show up on the videos as well. However, some viewers took issues with this, as her presence was sometimes considered disruptive to the regular flow of content. Personally, I don't get this very much because as far as I can tell, she was basically the female version of Phil and close to being as obnoxious and insensitive as he was. But anyway, yeah, you gotta like expose the Illuminati. They know everything but I know more. Viewers attempted to negotiate with Phil regarding her presence in the videos, but Phil, like he always does, took this constructive criticism as abject hatred and responded exactly how you'd expect him to. When a commenter said, don't mind her doing playthrough with you, but these type of vlogs should just be you, he replied with a very gracious, you're a f***ing idiot. The Leanna situation went on for a while, despite the consistent grumbling of some members of the audience. Until one day, it scabbed over during a stream in which Phil was playing Kingdom Hearts. Panda Lee began provoking the chat by making a series of remarks about the game's quality. Kingdom Hearts is boring. All fanboys, please cry into jars so I can moisturize in your sadness and rage. Due to this somewhat inflammatory comment towards a beloved franchise, people fell to her goading and began arguing with her in chat. This is hardly a shock, since when people are watching Phil play a game, it tends to be because they like the game. This went on until the crushing majority of chat turned against her, not just because they liked Kingdom Hearts, but because she was actively drawing negative attention to herself for no reason. All of it culminated in her appealing to Phil to do something about people being mean to her in chat, and so Phil conceded. All right, and now I'm going to tell everyone in the chat I had enough of your bullshit tonight. I see everyone arguing with my girlfriend instead of talking about the game, and I've had enough. So we're going to put it in sub-only mode, and now none of you can f***ing talk since you can't act your age or act mature, and you all want to argue with my girlfriend. Now you can just have no chat. How about that? So f*** all of you who are acting immature. This is what you get now. We're putting it into sub-only mode. An idiot. If people had found her to be a slight, even if infrequent, annoyance before, now she had been seen as a bully and a coward who was prone to instigating conflicts with her boyfriend's audience, only to run back under his umbrella of safety when people treated her how she treated others. She also took on Phil's tendencies regarding participating in flame wars in the comment sections, saying things like, I get paid for trolls to watch and whine, so I don't see the harm in letting me get paid for them to cry more. Yeah, you clearly aren't getting any, but Phil is and has for over a year now. And let's be honest, do you you think Phil and I care about what you or anyone else thinks? Because we don't. If you were in front of me face to face, you'd get a nice helping of my fist punching you right in the balls. Perhaps the most ironic moment out of the whole situation was that years later, Phil actually threw her under the bus and described her as someone who was confrontational and always wanted to get the one up on everyone else. I've mentioned it before, but that's exactly the same trait that made Phil so unlikable early on. So he's not even projecting it onto her. He's accurately noticing why they got along with each other so well. They were similar people. But Leanna did serve a purpose in the larger narrative of DSP. Her presence led to much more concrete displays of disrespect from Phil to his audience. Indirectly, she was the reason many of Phil's fans noticed how comfortable he was, disregarding their opinions and just doing whatever he wanted at their behest. Besides the beginning of Leanna's presence in his life and content, 2012 was also marked by even more examples of Phil being terrible at gaming, despite it being the core of his job. The most glaring instance was during a video of Half-Life Black Mesa, in which he failed to pay attention to the game's tutorial instructions, proceeded to struggle for 30 minutes in an area of the game because he didn't know how to crouch jump, and then claimed that this core mechanic of the game's movement was actually bugged. 
Up until this moment, Phil's haters were disorganized and disaffected, believing that no matter how poignant their criticisms of Phil and his content were, they'd just fall on deaf ears. But as 2013 began, this was fated to change. A YouTube account called Evil AJ 2010 uploaded the very first entry to a sprawling series of videos that would ultimately spell Phil's downfall as a content creator. This series was called This Is How You Don't Play, and it compiled DSP's playthroughs while highlighting the funniest examples of him being awful at a game. The first one contained clips of Phil playing Metal Gear, a stealth game like it was a regular action game and dying a lot in the process. Phil addressed this during one of his long-winded rant videos, and though he made an effort to claim that they were the dumb ones for bringing attention to DSP's playthroughs and indirectly making him money, it was clear that for whatever reason, being called bad at a game bugged him, even if just a little. At face value, it's just a video highlighting how much he sucks at Metal Gear Solid. It's not that big of a deal, right? Like, somebody could make a whole channel on how bad I am at video games. They could make <laughs> billions. But for Phil, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. The dam was cracking, and many of Phil's detractors, as he came to notoriously call them, saw it as a sign that they could also speak about their grievances with DSP in general. Slowly, the spark created by this video turned into a wildfire, and to an extent, it was more popular than Phil himself. Due to Phil's focus on quantity over quality, the views his videos got weren't really attached to him or his brand, nor on how good the videos were, hence why they oscillated so much depending on what game he played or what the video's topic was. Meanwhile, the How You Don't Play video catered to a very specific audience, people who didn't like Phil, and there was definitely an audience for that. It seemed like Phil felt the shift to his public image happen in real time, prompting him to make two videos to address the negativity, though he acted as if people actually hated him just because he was bad at the games. The thing is, many people have marketed their gaming videos on them sucking at it and dying a lot, but DSP was the opposite. He had a history of branding himself as a pro player and of blaming the game whenever he sucked. Part of his ego, part of his persona, was that he was good at games. Furthermore, he also had a history of putting other people down for not being good at games. Case in point, to Buskis. Back in mid-2012, he made a video called Get Competitors Ads Off My Videos that, supposedly, was just him being upset that other channels were being advertised for in his videos. Putting aside the issue that he was still pocketing the money for these ads, in actuality, the video was a lot more malicious than Phil led on. For a significant significant portion of it, he did nothing but bash Tabuskis gratuitously. That being said, please understand, disclaimer, this, uh, this video is not intended to be a direct attack on anyone. A few moments later. Your videos suck, you're not funny, and you're not good at gaming. Watch your own f***ing videos. You're horrible. When it comes to gaming, he's not funny. He's not funny. For starters, this was a straight up stupid move, since if you were into one gaming YouTuber back then, the likelihood is you were into a lot of the other ones. So all Phil was doing was angering the parts of his audience that he shared with Toby. But Phil also specifically and seriously attacked him for not being funny and sucking at games, both of which are DSP's whole brand, whether he knew it or not. Additionally, he suggested that Tabuskis, along with other gaming channels he chose not to name here, have found different ways to abuse the YouTube system to get big. This is coming from the man who purposely split his playthroughs into hundreds of different parts so that his total view count would go up, and asked for people to click on his ads so that he made more money from a video. Anyone with a cursory knowledge of DSP recognized he was throwing giant rocks from a extremely thin glass house. Last but not least, he says other gaming YouTubers don't put as much effort into their gameplays as he does, despite the fact that as of May 2012, he was still refusing to buy a capture card to properly record his playthroughs instead of pointing a camera at his screen. In his mind, his decision to not pay anyone to edit and approve his SEO by making decent thumbnails for him is justified due to how stellar his commentary is, so much so that he describes it as non-stop improv comedy. I'm not going to sit here and act like popular early 2010s gaming content was all comedy gold, but Phil's brand of comedy definitely managed to be even more obnoxious. All in all, it was very clear that Phil was simply seething because there was someone being more professional than he was and making more money than he did because of it. Okay, and then they hired Toby Turner to be the guy backstage, he's acting like an asshole, he acts like he's a goofball, he's self-deprecating, complete, utter flop. This entire commotion was particularly rich due to how many times Phil accused other people of disliking him out of jealousy, including the creator of the How You Don't Play series. The wave of hate towards DSP coalesced into a decentralized group called Kojima World Order, whose intro can be seen in many of the detractors' videos at the time. Unfortunately, there was also a downside to Phil being faced with all of these criticisms. It gave him the opportunity to play the victim. Despite his decline in viewership having begun all the way back when YouTube's ad revenue system switched to retention, he swiftly shifted the 
the blame to evil AJ and everyone who was on his side, if that could be said, as a side to be on. Finally, in early to mid-2013, DSP did the unthinkable and bought a capture card, presumably his way of caving to the negativity. Also known as listening to reasonable advice your own audience has been giving you for years as to as to what they want to see or, or maybe just like what the industry standard is. However, it was a little too late and the tide had already turned against him for good. Undeterred, Phil went on to cause even greater controversy within his audience when he started the hardcore gaming season giveaway of 2013, when rather than giving away actual games, he instead gave away empty boxes. <laughs> this is Deus Ex Human Revolution, collector's edition. Comes with this very nifty collector's box on the inside. Comes with a few things. First of all, collector's edition packaging. As you open that up, you're gonna see the game's gone because I traded it in years ago. This got him lambasted and unsubscribed from, even by many of his diehard fans. Besides his fans, he was also being ridiculed by his peers. Other YouTubers and gaming adjacent celebrities anywhere from 2013 to mid-2014 were finding out who DSP was from the clips of him floating around online. PewDiePie and Minecraft's creator Nosh were roped into the DSP phenomenon. Even fellow blip.tv adjacent lolcow Spoonie was roped in. Perhaps the most notable instance of another YouTuber chiming in with their two cents about DSP's situation was Total Biscuit, but not because it was the most aggressive takedown. As a matter of fact, it was quite the opposite. It was one of the most scathing pieces of criticism DSP ever received, precisely because of how generous and understanding it was as far as trying to see it from Phil's point of view. After being mentioned a few times by DSP, Total Biscuit made a comment saying, If DSP is name dropping me a lot, I don't know why. It's really weird that he's doing that. He's not my friend or colleague. I've barely spoken to him. I dislike DSP's content and his attitude. I've done some terrible things on the internet that I regret, but nothing close to the stuff he does on a very regular basis. He is a really, really bad Let's Player, constantly blaming the game for his own mistakes, and I find that really distasteful. If you make your living playing someone else's work, then the least you can do is respect the work that went into it in the first place. I don't like to see someone harassed online daily. I've experienced it myself, and it's put me in some really dark places. But to say DSP brings it on himself is a massive understatement. His persona is the king of hate. He does it on purpose, and there's a lot of baggage that comes with being super negative. That's like his only defining characteristic. He's not good at the games he plays. He's a controversy machine, and that feeds his channel. Nothing I've seen him do has caused anything positive to happen. Here's the thing. Insulting your fans is often blown out of proportion. DSP is terrible for this, and most of what he says to his viewers is inexcusable, but let's not pretend that viewers are immune to criticism themselves. They often act like assholes, they're entitled, whiny, and provide a lot of subjective criticism with no constructive use. It can drain you emotionally and mentally to be subject to that kind of stuff all the time, and I really feel like part of that is why DSP acts the way he does now. Sometimes viewers do shitty things and should be called out, but let's be frank, DSP DSP has a long history of calling viewers out for no reason. Rather than try to move away from that, he has embraced it. I'd like to see DSP get some help. Therapy. DSP in his current form doesn't help anyone, least of all himself, and incidents like the I'm giving away boxes thing make me believe he has some problems that he needs to deal with and get past, because regular people would not consider that a normal, sensible thing to do. I kind of pity him, but there's no smoke without fire, and DSP is a metaphorical arsonist obsessed with burning his house down. Kojima World Order is still hilarious. Phil, upon reading that comment, didn't take kindly to it. The the entire comment is incredibly flawed. It's obvious he doesn't watch my content at all and has only formed an idea of who I am and what I produce from the KWO montages. Because watching any playthrough for more than 5 minutes outside of Metal Gear Solid 2 and 3, you'd know that my content isn't constantly bashing games, game devs, and blaming the game exclusively. Yes, complaining about the games are part of what I do, but not nearly 100% of the content I put out. The fact he thinks that the king of hate means that I've embraced being negative about everything and that's my hook just proves he has no idea whatsoever what he's talking about. Total Biscuit thinks that his videos are some kind of godsend because he's informing people about new games that you might not have heard of, and frequently he rips the sucky ones a new asshole. He thinks his content is better than mine because people don't buy bad games when they see his stuff. Only I've gotten thousands of messages over the years saying the exact same thing about my playthroughs and or reviews. Just because he puts out one highly edited video and I play through an entire game from start to finish doesn't make him better than me. And honestly, one edited video versus playing through an entire game, which is really harder to do. Seeking therapy because I sometimes get upset over slash baited by trolls? Um, if I'd let it get that much to me, I'd be in a nut house by now. Little did Phil know he was indeed in a nut house, except it was his condo and only had one inmate, himself. Besides him pretending like Total Biscuit was saying DSP's content was exclusively negative, Phil completely sidesteps the treating fans like shit accusation and the empty box giveaway so that he doesn't have to acknowledge there's at least an inkling of truth to TB's comment. Despite the fast approaching instability due to his plummeting and popularity and YouTube's ad revenue policies not treating his content 
unkindly whatsoever. The financial mastermind that is Phil Burnell decided it was time to once again buy a new condo, this time in Washington. Supposedly, he had no outstanding debt besides his condo, which he was still paying the mortgage for, and decided that Connecticut was too expensive to live in due to its very high taxes. So much so that it was worth it getting a house in another state, despite his outright admission that he had no prospects of selling or renting the Connecticut condo. In early 2014, Phil and Leanna move in together. Phil made it clear from the get-go that he was going to need his audience's money. A lot of it. Again, the issue isn't necessarily that he's asking for support, it's that the reason he needs support in the first place is that he decided to do a very expensive move at the same time his channel was dying. To make matters worse, he tried implying that his lack of money wasn't his fault, but that the slow months he was experiencing was due to the games being released at the time not being good. It even got to the point that he suggested he was going to upgrade his video's quality to 1080p. You know the situation is bad when Darkseid Phil is considering doing the bare minimum, but the trolls didn't fall for the pity party. If anything, his pivot to e-begging after his AdSense brute force strategy was no longer functional only earned him even more distaste, since instead of doing the smart thing by admitting this format was outdated and obsolete and changing it radically, he would rather beg for his fans to give him money directly. Before, Phil was just ignoring the requests of people who watched him, but now he was setting himself up to inevitably ignore the requests of people directly putting money in his pocket. But tensions weren't rising exclusively on the YouTube front. Over at his fan forum, because yes, he has a fan forum, the users were beginning to become upset over DSP's tyrannical method of management. Without due justification or warnings, Phil tended to ban users and lock threads without any concern. One infamous quote to come out of this situation was Phil saying, I can't break the rules, I am the rules. I believe he's actually unknowingly quoting Louis XIV, King of France, who said, I am the law, I am the state. His own fan base got so sick of it that even the mods of the forum, who were appointed by Phil himself, took issue with it and tried to strike an agreement with Phil so that by establishing clearer rules, he would no longer act as an administrator and let them do their job. Consequently, he made a post announcing it. Effective immediately, all account names, avatars, signatures, etc. related to known internet memes dedicated to negativity regarding myself or my work are considered trolling, and per forum rules are a permanently bannable offense. This includes the Kojima World Order in particular, but is not limited to it. I'm already seeing accounts that, no surprise, are popping up on the site and doing nothing but spreading unfair and unwarranted negativity about me. I'm all for legit criticism, but these anti-DSP movements are not that. They're one-sided bullying campaigns and will not be tolerated on my my site in place of business. If you have a problem with that, contact an admin for immediate deactivation of your account. Thanks all for understanding and moving forward positively. Despite this agreement, Phil proceeded to not uphold his end of the bargain by permabanning a user for what he deemed was unwarranted and unproven slander. The mods of the forum, along with many of the Twitch mods, resigned en masse, saying, For those who read the settled agreement, this was not allowed. It was in direct violation of our agreement. We tried our best to stay, and unfortunately, we failed in that regard. All the best, the departing staff. Noticing that even his own mods had left him, or in his eyes, betrayed him, a la Julius Caesar, Phil decided to respond on the forums. Mods did not uphold their end of the bargain first, which is why we've come to this. I refuse to pay thousands of dollars for a website where I get personally attacked with slander on a daily basis by the same people. Getting slaps on the wrist, such as warning points, haven't done anything to change the fact that the forums are a shooting gallery for my head. In the future, I'll either be seeking new forum staff who actually have the time and willingness to properly moderate, or I'll be downgrading the forum altogether to something more manageable for less people. I guess I didn't really need a $3,000 website, and I set myself up for failure when I got it. Thanks for those leaving, and I wish you all well in the future. For those wishing to stay, let me know so we can talk stuff out. I actually don't know what the hell he's talking about here. There are free forum template websites you can use for free, so unless he's an absolute idiot, he's a really bad liar. As a matter of fact, there's no reason to even bring up $3,000 in the first place, so I suspect he just said it to brag. Unless he's trying to suggest he was paying for the moss to do their job, in which case we're back to lying because they were unpaid. The situation continued to escalate as an administrator ousted Phil and would continue to take over the site, who in turn canceled the giveaway he was doing at the time due to it relying on fan art that was being published on the site. After the site was flooded with not safe for work images and completely wrecked, it went down and stayed down for good. At least until Phil revived it sometime later with a new, less inflammatory name. Just the DSP forums. When someone entered DSP's stream as he played Mortal Kombat 10, they successfully got him to lose his temper by bringing up the Leanna Kingdom Hearts incident, prompting Phil to spend the next few minutes just airing out his rage. He's talking about something that happened two fucking years ago on Twitch. I mean, could you be more of a fucking loser? Seriously. He really, the reason this guy joined my match was to do that. Not to play the game, not to have fun. He ruins it for everyone. Delays people who want to play have to wait now, right? Because we have to listen to this fucking idiot. I mean, what? 
Ladies and gentlemen, you have found the epitome of a loser on the internet. The tirade alienated vast swaths of his audience, and he apologized the very next day in a video on his YouTube channel. For once, this was an appropriate response, even if he was pressured into doing it. Every once in a while, Phil does seem to exhibit a sense of clarity. For example, some of his trolls dox his new location back in the summer of 2014, which wasn't a very difficult task to do considering how careless DSP was about it. It took a long time for someone to do something with that information, but after five consecutive days of being DDoS attacked, someone tried to swap Watt Phil, saying he either had or was in the process of murdering his girlfriend and her family. I don't have to explain how absolutely unjustified and dangerous this was, but thankfully, Phil had already been in contact with the police because he predicted something like that would happen. Perhaps because something similar already had happened at some point, but that's just speculation. However, Phil took this as an opportunity to conflate the people who tried to swat him and falsely accuse him with anyone and everyone who had ever made a this is how you don't play video or mocked him on the internet, saying that it was the negative vibe people created around him that almost cost him his life. As bad as swatting is, that's just a silly thing for him to do, especially in the relatively serious situation he found himself in at the time. Obviously, not every hater is responsible for the one nut job that decided to swat him. The noise surrounding his name was getting a tad too loud for Phil's liking, but since he was too proud to start paying an editor and putting out decent content to quell the mutiny that the Kojima World Order had created, his strategy to deal with his detractors was to abuse the copyright privileges he had, in part due to being a member of Machinima to strike the channel of whoever was badmouthing him. Once again, Total Biscuit, this time along with Slow Beef, popped up on Twitter to address what Phil was up to with the abusive copyright claims. Ironically, DSP was soon going to suffer the same fate he put many people through at this time, when DSP Gaming began facing various copyright ID takedown notices due to his use of fan art in his pre-streams. The threat that this post to Phil's livelihood was so immense that drastic action would be taken. Hundreds of playthroughs that featured fan art were deleted and privated in order to prevent further strikes. Consequently, the accumulated views on DSP's channel dropped dramatically, which, according to Phil, lowered his ranking in the YouTube search engine. Not only was his personality pushing people away from his videos and streams, now his privileged spot in the eyes of the algorithm was going away, and the house of cards was very quickly collapsing. Again, this is not something I wish on anyone, not even someone as annoying as Phil. Having your livelihood ravaged is a terrible thing. However, the crux of the issue is despite having actively participated in bringing all of this upon himself, he simply wouldn't stop in blaming exclusively other people for the damage done to his channel. Additionally, he returned to directly asking his viewers for money, this time with a Patreon already set up, which which, around this period of mid to late 2015, was making a little over $1,000 a month. Like he always did when it came to asking for money, he brought up the topics of his taxes and bills, saying he had to pay off his house. But it was clear to anyone with half a brain that Phil was not exactly living frugally. He had nothing resembling savings to subsist on, and actually dependent on things like the hike in revenue in the latter half of the year to keep himself afloat through all of the debt he had incurred. None of which is explained to the viewer, of course, because that would reveal just how financially irresponsible Phil truly was. Due to the declining ad revenue, Machinima once again renegotiated their contract with Phil and lowered his salary. Instead of looking inward to where he could improve on his content, he decided to strike out at people who watched his videos with an ad blocker, calling them thieves among other things. Though he'd previously pledged to never again ask for money online, saying he would rather get a different job than be an e-beggar, he presumably reconsidered this when he realized how good he actually had it in comparison to a real job, and he didn't want to lose his YouTube gig. He'd actually ridiculed the mere concept of asking people for money, saying he would feel morally bad to be in such a situation. Everything is a tax write-off. I don't need money, you know, I don't want that. That's ridiculous that I would have people be sending me money and stuff, and I'm still not asking for that, and I would actually morally feel bad if that were the case, if I were to have to do stuff like that, and I never, I really hope that I never will. Of course, there's nothing wrong with opening up a Patreon per se, but when you try to guilt trip people into paying for debts that you chose to incur, there's definitely a problem at hand. This wasn't the only instance of Phil eating his own words either. He spent years mocking any Let's Player who did Minecraft videos, going as far as to say it was only widely played because it was free. The reason that people were playing Minecraft is because it is free. Guess what, Notch? You're a f***ing idiot. Once Patreon time rolled around, he changed his tune to simply having missed the game and set it as one of the tiers. However, much like any of the other obligations Phil made to his patrons during this time, he would fail to fulfill the extent of what was promised, with him only playing one of four prospective Minecraft sessions due to low viewership. Another incident came when users voted Persona 3 to be that month's Patreon game. After a four-month playthrough, he reached the final boss, only to rage quit it and not finish, saying it was the worst designed boss fight he'd ever done. He only returned to Persona 3 later, 
that we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Another tier on the DSP Patreon was yet another reboot of Project 7, which he promised to do if he hit $1,250 a month. The goal was met, and he took some time off of streaming to work on it. Just two weeks later, he indefinitely postponed production, saying to do Project 7 at that time would not make sense, all while refusing to refund the money donated for that specific purpose. It was also around this time that Phil decided he would only fulfill his pledge obligations if the pledges surpassed the set goals by several hundred dollars, supposedly to counteract the abundance of false pledges he was receiving on Patreon. In addition to this controversy, the prospect of another Project 7 reboot reignited whatever was left of Phil's deteriorating relationship with Howard and John, who at this point were very mad at Phil for a variety of reasons, including the fact he monetized the video he made talking about their mutual acquaintance, Scott. The entirety of their back and forth adds up to several hours, but the short of it was that, ever since his move to Washington, there was no longer a real friendship between Phil, John, and Howard. Since this time, Phil has made clear on multiple occasions how he simply doesn't have the time to invest into friendships, instead sinking his time into his business, something that apparently continues to this day. Much later on, Phil recognized that during this time period, it wasn't just his professional life that was tumbling down, but also his personal life. His relationship with Leanna was deteriorating, and he'd completely lost touch with his best friends from his peak era, both of which are cited as some of the most negatively impactful moments of his life. He also recalls doing nothing but eating fast food and drinking to such an extreme point that he describes himself as being an alcoholic at the time. Pretty sad, and despite everything, you can't help but feel pretty bad for the guy. DSP began 2016 with a three-pronged plan. On his main account, DSP Gaming, he'd continue posting playthroughs like he always did, while his vlogs went to the King of Hate Vlog DSP, and his edited videos and montages were uploaded to a third account called KO Gaming. After a rough 2015 that introduced Phil to the consequences of behaving the way he did, he was angling to outwork his lack of manners and the audience of trolls he had attracted. It was supposed to be his year. Phil would finally become Himothy, until one foolish mistake sapped his momentum right at the very beginning. One of of the ways he found to make up for his past shortcomings as a content creator was to return to Persona 3 to beat it, as he was supposed to do a long time before. However, just as his live stream for it was about to begin and the screen was set on a message informing people that it would start shortly, he mistakenly left his webcam on and visible to the viewers. In doing so, he exposed his audience to what appears to be his pre-stream preparation ritual, if we can call it that. I'm pretty sure I can't really show it on screen even though it's not explicit per se since you can't see any of it happening, but it's fairly obvious based on the fast-paced jerking motions and his facial expressions that DSP is cranking one out immediately prior to beginning a stream. As soon as he's very visibly done, the live stream starts and he says, Oh, the camera's on. The camera's been on the whole time, huh? Almost as if he was knowingly nodding to those who had the displeasure of witnessing the whole thing. As far as live streams go, this comes close to the mother of all of them. It was covered by Keemstar of Drama Alert, and potentially, it's the single most well-known moment of DSP's career to this day, however ironic and depressing that may seem. Phil's first response to the situation was to simply ban anyone in stream chat that questioned him on what exactly he was up to during that pre-stream. Due to the stream only having 20 to 30 people on it at a time, and since a a lot of people watch live streams in the background while doing something else, like gaming, he probably thought this moment would simply sink into obscurity and be quickly forgotten about by those who had witnessed it. I wonder, in the hundreds, maybe even thousands of hours of DSP live streaming and unedited videos leading up to this, if that or something equivalent has happened before, and it just got lost, like tears in the rain. His next move was to berate those who suggested he was such a degenerate as to masturbate in front of his YouTube viewers publicly, before proceeding to claim he was simply scratching his leg. I don't know one single human on earth that enjoys scratching their leg that much. And honestly, I feel like if he had just acknowledged what happened and made a joke out of it, it probably would have been pretty funny. He just couldn't do that. The hit to his ego was too big. After the immediate shock and embarrassment wore him down to the point where Phil felt comfortable in ceasing his reflexive lying, about a day later, he embraced it and admitted that he was, in fact, not just scratching his leg. Due to how thoroughly he welcomed the mockery this time around, some people thought that Phil either faked it or did it on purpose in order to get attention to his floundering career. However, as misdirected a person as Phil is, I doubt this is the case, not only because it falls outside of the purview of the typical shenanigans he gets up to, but I honestly also think he lacks the imagination one needs to have that sort of move. It's too Andy Kaufman for good old Phil. There are way simpler and less risky ways to boost engagement besides public humiliation, and if we've learned anything, Phil loves to self-aggrandize, not the opposite. To be fair, despite how bad the incident in and of itself is, this is one of Phil's most competent bouts of dealing with backlash, as he just very quickly owned up to it with in like a day or two. However, despite dealing with this flub minimally well, Phil couldn't look very optimistically towards the future of his career and was very much past his prime. On the 1st of May 2016, while streaming 
the new Pokemon game, Pokemon Moon on Twitch, his fans would incur Phil's wrath as he lashed out at them. Quite honestly, let me take a look, because I have not looked at stream numbers all day. My god, the stream numbers were terrible. Wow, what happened? Here's the bottom line, and I'm tired of it now. No more excuses, alright? Because the bottom line is people are like, Phil's not engaged in his commentary, and Phil's commentary is boring, and that's why people don't want to watch the playthroughs of the streams. Bullshit. I'm loving this game, I'm voice acting, I'm engaged, I'm commentating on everything that's going on actively. Bullshit. I call massive bullshit on any idiot who says that about either the Watch Dogs 2, which I've been playing recently and really liking, or Pokemon. It's bullshit. I call complete and utter bullshit on anyone who's saying that I'm not engaged and I sound like I'm bored. I'm not. So, I've had enough excuses. It just seems to me like people are fucking lazy and don't want to come out to the streams. I don't even know what else to say, you know? There are few mistakes as easy to avoid as openly complaining you don't get more viewers. And while it's not a particularly grave one, it shines a light on Phil's perennial state of mind. He isn't open to consider that his lack of popularity is due to the lack of quality of his content, or better yet, the consequences of his behavior as an online personality. Phil received backlash from his fan base, which was then compounded by other creators like Review Tech USA, who covered his little tantrum on livestream. Phil apologized for calling his viewers lazy, but remained steadfast in his belief that the viewership drop-off has nothing to do with the content itself. At this point in time, the How You Don't Play videos made with clips from Phil's content had completely eclipsed Phil's actual content as far as views and engagement, and Phil thought to capitalize on the community source content. He allowed other people to submit videos to be uploaded to the KO Gaming channel, and promised to pay them with, you guessed it, exposure by having their channel's name in the description. I have to make a small note here by saying that he still hasn't tried hiring an editor to work for him to help make his Let's Play content washable. It's actually mesmerizing. Anyway, the success of post Posting community source content on KO Gaming was short-lived, as in 2016, the channel was demonetized for reasons unclear. His situation was already dire as far as channel growth was concerned, but soon, things took a turn for the worse. As the adpocalypse hit in early 2017, much of Phil's backlog on his other two channels got demonetized, meaning he could no longer profit off of them and depended even more on his immediate income. However, the potential for AdSense revenue was stripped away from Phil when his content was deemed advertiser-unfriendly, mostly because of the years of content on each channel loaded with every offensive expletive known to man. Because of this quick succession of unfortunate events, Phil found himself unable to pay for the immense amounts of credit card debt he had accrued, the mortgage for his new home, potentially even the mortgage for his old home as well since it's not clear that he stopped paying it, and last but not least, the medication he needed for his chronic back pain. This panic over his future led to even greater tensions with Machinima, who advised DSP to start uploading shorter edited content to try and amend the declining rates of viewership. However, at this point, DSP is almost a decade into phoning it in, and especially now that he's tight on money, there's no way he's paying for someone competent to edit a slop. Incapable of understanding how the business model of his own business operates, Phil thinks that Machinima, along with Google, is shafting him out of money after years of his loyal servitude. In his mind, they owe him something, even if the content simply is not working out. Strangely, he seems to believe that the changes in algorithm were somehow malicious in nature, and that they owed him an explanation as to why he was being treated unfairly. He released a video airing out his grievances and basically saying that he'll get to the bottom of it, as if there was something to get to the bottom of. There's no deeper explanation to it, other than his low quality standards put his channel in a bad situation, and once the apocalypse hit, he was too exposed and got the worst of it. Phil obviously didn't see it that way and wanted to get a satisfactory answer as to why he was making so little money, and primarily he wanted an answer to why it wasn't his fault. His tirade heightened the friction between him and Machinima, and finally their partnership came to an end as Phil was fired from the network. Probably one of the only people to ever be fired from the Machinima network. By March 2017, views had never been lower, despite Despite how frequently content was being pumped out, Phil's merch on Teespring wasn't bringing in enough revenue to keep things afloat, so he went on the search for a new MCN to be a part of so that he could continue his work. Keep in mind, by 2017, MCNs were basically phased out from YouTube. Most people saw them as scams, or in other words, companies that take all of your money, give you a portion of it, and don't really do anything for you as a result. But here, Phil was still looking for an MCN. Eventually, he found one called Curse, which was willing to take him in. This was a bit foolish on their part, I should say, since he promptly abandoned them to sign with another MCN, Laveria Media, who offered him content ID protection, with the bonus of allowing him to copyright claim the derivative videos of his detractors. Soon after, Phil noticed Laveria's inability to commit to any of their promises to him on writing, and sussed out that they probably weren't going to be able to meet his expectations. So he returned to Curse, which, while less lucrative, allowed Phil to continue his work. However, just as one negative feedback loop is looking like it might stop, another one begins. Phil's domestic life with Leanna became turbulent. Leanna, by this time, had recently gotten herself 
herself a job and is the breadwinner of the family, was often out working. Probably because of the life experience she was accruing while at work, surrounded by adults with expectations of responsibility and maturity, she began maturing herself, and naturally, muted tensions rose between her and Phil. In early 2017, she tweeted a photo of a fake engagement ring saying, My co-workers keep asking me when Phil and I are getting married, even though we aren't engaged. Gotta fake it. While seemingly small, it communicated a lot about how their relationship was going. She wanted more out of it. She wanted commitment, expecting Phil to take it to the next level, while he was comfortably inert. While he acted very confused on stream when he was brought up, it appears he quickly took the hint and got engaged to her, though he admitted there was no hope of having an actual marriage take place due to Phil's unstable finances. Despite the proposal, there were various signs that they were adrift and on a fast track to separation. A little while later, Leanna suffered an anxiety attack that was so intense it landed her in the hospital. This flare-up of her condition compounded on top of their already bad situation, since they had to pay for her three-hour stay in the emergency room, despite her receiving nothing resembling treatment besides a pill, according to Phil. The reason for her anxiety attack is unknown. It could just be from the stress of having a job, but many people speculate it had to do with her relationship with Phil. Soon enough, Leanna did break up with Phil and moved out. While he denied it for a brief period, he eventually did speak out on it, saying the following. Since there's been tons of speculation and it makes sense to clear it up, yes, it's true that Leanna and I have broken up. We actually broke up a while ago and she moved out two weeks ago. We purposefully agreed to keep quiet to prevent any unnecessary drama on either side, being that we both have public personas and social media presence and we're still on good speaking terms. This is a personal matter between us dealing with behind the scenes occurrences and feelings that quite frankly are nobody's businesses but our own. I wish Leanna the best, I still talk with her regularly, and we'd both appreciate it if you'd respect our privacy on this matter. As in, don't bother asking for details because you won't get them. In fact, this is probably the only time I'll really address it, as I'd prefer to move on positively and focus on the future. There will not be any videos made on this subject. Thanks for understanding. Meanwhile, the trolls took this opportunity to make a phone call to the radio station 897 KACC and requested the song Baby Come Back on Phil's behalf. 897 KACC, we got a dedication in. <sighs> these, these kids and their names, I swear. So... Dark Side Phil wants to dedicate a song to Panda Lee. He wants to dedicate Baby Come Back by Player. Regardless, it was clear that Leanna leaving hit Phil like a ton of bricks, perhaps even worse than his financial issues. He began sleeping poorly and began struggling to eat as well, as he used to eat after Leanna made him dinner. Along with the ending of his friendship with John and Howard, Phil has described his breakup with Leanna as one of the most negatively impactful things to have happened to him in his life. At this point, he was more of a Twitch streamer than a YouTuber since he was getting increasingly less results from his uploads, and still, the request for donations to his Patreon kept becoming more frequent. His trolls found themselves at a crossroads. Like a dog chasing a car, they didn't know whether to celebrate Phil finally approaching rock bottom or to mourn how low he'd come. By November 2017, Phil got into another relationship, one that he publicly announced in early 2018 by posting a picture of a red-haired woman tending to his Christmas tree, though her identity was concealed. The trolls' response to this was to quickly start a thread on Kiwi Farms, claiming to be a lady of the night who was hired to pretend to be DSP's girlfriend. And what is perhaps the strangest twist of this entire story, it turns out the people behind this particular troll campaign were Patrick and Brenda Bronsgeist, a pair of professional scammers who used pictures of young women without their consent to swindle victims of their money. After a decade of their grift, it was their attempt at defaming Phil that caused their undoing. The woman whose picture they used to pretend to be Phil's fake girlfriend was contacted and promptly refuted their story, and just like that, the thread was gone. The account that made this thread was soon linked to another pseudonym, Angelina Capri, who had registered a domain in the name of none other than Patrick Bronsgeist. By the time they changed the registry information to the domain providers, it was too late. Kiwi Farms had already gotten to them. Scouring the internet for any information they could find about them, they came up with various indecent images of Brenda, among other things. Another account linked to Patrick was recorded attempting to provoke Phil during Twitch streams, claiming to be a patron who would rescind his pledge if Phil didn't address the rumors directly. Whether this was a botched attempt to extort Phil, or just a way to kick him when he was already down for entertainment is still unknown. Owner of Kiwi Farms, Null, would personally email Phil seeking to clear the air around the situation. I love love drama. I also really hate being lied to. The escort story had steam to it because the escort identity had tweets mentioning you going back four years before the first this is how you don't play. The escort profile itself had its identity verified by a third party. Every single thing they said was impossible to disprove, but it fell apart in January when she claimed and no one believed you had 
someone. That threw her entire story out of balance, and people began looking for what was going on. The truth? They were professional catfishers, a Dutch couple using random girls' picks to get money and Amazon wishlist items. They were genuine fans of yours in 2014, but turned attractor, then decided to use their extensive catfishing profile against you. I know you don't want to visit my site, so this is an archive of the full details on a third-party site. It totally exonerates you. Cheers, big ears. Following this fiasco, Phil introduced his new girlfriend, Kat. Compared to Leanna, who was outgoing and often outspoken to the point of being jarring for Phil's following, Kat was more shy. Refusing to participate in Phil's playthroughs and seemingly being averse to having her photo shared, she appeared so uncomfortable in front of a camera that it quickly became a gag that Phil had kidnapped her as a hostage. Regardless of what was being said by the detractors, this was a good sign for their relationship, since Kat wanted nothing to do with Phil's online presence and what it came packaged with. In 2018, Phil tried to replicate the virality of his original DSP Tries It, Axe Body Detailer video, but it was quickly overshadowed by another controversy he involved himself in. At the time, prominent streamers and influencers received copies of the newly released State of Decay 2, common practice for companies who want to promote their products. Upon realizing he was simply too irrelevant to be viable as a recipient of a free copy, Phil took to Twitter to rant. Those playing State of Decay 2 a full week early are paid shills. They are walking advertisements, not true gamers, and are doing so solely for a paycheck. I'll be paying for the game and playing it this Friday, just like so many of you, and my reactions will be legit, as always. Within a day, Phil retracted the statement once he realized he himself had received free copies of games such as Fallout 4 and Dark Souls 3, and that would obviously make him look like a hypocrite. So he retracted the statement, presumably because he himself had received free copies. Not only did he acknowledge the hypocrisy, he also suggested using Twitter for business purposes exclusively to prevent similar situations in the future. Despite his promising relationship with Kat at this point in time, Phil opened up to his audience about his struggles with depression, pointing to the times when he acted extremely stupid and self-destructive as times that he had underlying issues. Years later, it seems he was at least partially admitting that Total Biscuit was right in assessing him as someone, quote unquote, obsessed with burning his own house down. In July 2018, YouTube guidelines for MCNs changed, and now every report on a client of theirs had to be manually reviewed. This proved a very big problem for Curse, since for every stream Phil did, there were dozens of trolls willing to mass report him, creating a massive backlog of reports that someone at Curse had to be burdened with. Because of this, along with Phil's low numbers, they decided to drop him, meaning Phil was once again a free agent. This was particularly impactful on his finances since the month prior, he maxed out his credit cards to pay off the total sum of state taxes he owed, and without an MCN, his main channel, DSP Gaming, apparently couldn't be monetized. He did find a brief period of relief thanks to one troll, who spent a hefty sum on donations to him, planning to eventually charge Phil back for all of it, but ultimately the chargeback didn't work and Phil got to keep the money. Since he no longer had the MCN's AdSense linked to his main account, Phil had to appeal his original ban on DSP Gaming from 2010 in order to make a living. He started uploading his new content into his long dormant KO gaming account, but that wasn't much of a fix considering the channel was dead from the lack of uploads and engagement. Phil truly was between a rock and a hard place here. On Twitch, he aired out his frustrations in regards to his dwindling income and a lack of financial support from his YouTube viewers, saying, I'm gonna make a video about it tonight, asking those who watch on YouTube to pledge on Patreon for real this time. If people watch on YouTube, that's no excuse anymore. You guys on stream, I cannot really ask for more. You guys give me so much already. But those YouTube viewers at this point are just taking sh for granted and it has to stop. Those who have watched me on YouTube for 10 years and just take it for granted that I'll always be there and need a wake up call. How am I getting thousands of views on my video and having less than 200 patrons? In the video, he announces that from now on, on KO Gaming, he will be heeding to people's requests and uploading long form content, almost as an archive to his streams, instead of hundreds of 10 minute or shorter clips that he used to do. Though this is a concession, it's done very begrudgingly and it's not timely whatsoever. It would have been significant had he done this five years prior, but now it's just too little too late. I should make a note here that he's more than willing to press his YouTube viewers for wanting to watch something without paying for it. Meanwhile, he's not very eager to press himself to get a real job if his financial situation is as dire as he claims it is. It's almost like he's completely sidestepping his monetary burdens and placing them squarely on his viewers, like they're the ones in debt to him. Luckily for Phil, DSP Gaming did eventually regain monetization. During that year's Halloween stream, after participating on the stream for a couple of games, Kat abruptly left the stream to go out with her friends. Later on, Phil revealed that the real reason she left was because of the excess of trolls and chat that were upsetting her. One troll in particular got the brunt of Phil's ire, the almighty Tevin. Why does everyone want me to give Tevin a birthday shout out? You guys are f***ing lame trolls. What, who cares if I say happy birthday to Tevin or not? Happy birthday to my number one f***ing thief who deserves jail time for the amount of f***ing stuff that he steals illegally, except that YouTube won't do anything about it and he knows that I can't afford to stop him. Happy birthday, sh**.
your head. Tevin's claim to fame, besides beating Phil in Street Fighter on one occasion, is having tried out the Wings of Redemption playbook on DSP, deliberately calling him Dave instead of Phil to get a rise out of him. Although it didn't catch on as much as Wings' Richard Samuel routine, it was an admirable effort. Besides being responsible for restreaming many of Phil's streams, Tevin had been around for quite some time, knowing of DSP since before 2010. What's interesting is that many of Phil's most prominent detractors at one point were actually fans of him. Quite the Batman dynamic he has going on. Due to all the DSP derivative content Tevin had uploaded, Phil began frequently accusing Tevin of stealing his content, comparing him to a bank robber, among other things. For a brief period, he was the primary recipient of DSP's ire, to the point where the phrase, it's Tevin's fault, became one of the rallying cries for the detractors, especially during that period. But no matter how much Phil accused others, ultimately, he was his own worst enemy. Despite being a very meek person in real life, according to everyone who's actually encountered him, online, Phil just had conflict in his nature. Some were less personal, such as his brief friction with low-tier God, as the two were often compared to each other due to both being very toxic Street Fighter players. As a matter of fact, they even fought a match in game once. <laughs> Starts off the match with a scrub cycle press, a frame that it can work. Another fighting game adjacent beef Phil was unable to stop himself from entering was when Alpha Omega Sin used him as an example of people who rage quit matches, to which Phil replied by qualifying that when he purposefully throws a match, it's not rage quitting because he doesn't actually quit. A highlight of Phil's response is when his audience outright tells him that to make a response and address it is just going to create more negativity and he should let it go, to which he responds that he's been the bigger man for a very long time, meaning it's okay for him to engage with someone saying something bad about him just this once. I guess Guess that's sort of Phil's general sin as a content creator, he's unwilling to not engage with negativity, which makes for a very depreciated viewing experience for people who actually want to watch his streams. He also got in some trouble in 2019 when talking about the passing of Twitch streamer Etika. While he does express sympathy for Etika, he makes the mistake of pontificating about his own situation in 2017, leading many people to claim he was making what happened about himself. The video also attracted some negative attention due to it briefly being monetized after it being uploaded, with the first line in the description being a Streamlabs link to give Phil a tip. Honestly, I think this one's not that big of a deal, but obviously someone was mad. In a similar instance, about a year later, Phil got himself in hot water again, this time regarding Kobe Bryant's passing. Today's just a bad day. Kobe Bryant passes away in a tragic helicopter crash. My slaves get corrupted and deleted from friggin' nights. What else could happen? I hope nothing else. I hope that's it. DSP had a history of conflating other people's circumstances with irrelevant or petty things. For example, when Toby Turner was facing some very serious allegations in April 2016, Phil posted a video covering his personal story with Toby. The only problem was, his gripes with Toby were over things like Phil's opinions on his content or Toby having been disruptive and cringy during E3 2011, when the topic at hand was Toby potentially being a sex offender. Another example of Phil's pettiness knowing no boundaries involved fellow YouTuber Pro Jared. In 2016, Jared made an innocuous tweet saying, I took a wrong turn on in the internet and ended up reading DSP hilarity, haha, <laughs> whoops. A whole three years later, when Jared was faced with accusations that he cheated on his wife and was exchanging salacious DMs with minors, Phil actually remembered this microscopic dig and spoofed it, saying, took a day off from the entire internet, but hashtag pro Jared hilarity was at the top of everyone's Twitter feed, haha, <laughs> whoops. In an unrelated video, he outright brags about biding his time and keeping his eye on the bigger YouTuber who had punched down on him, but he made no comment when Jared addressed the accusations of himself and largely disprove them. This tweet went viral and got positive reactions from a few other prominent content creators, and Phil had a mind to capitalize on the first morsel of positive online attention he got in the entire decade. How did he do this? Not by pushing out some content to capture people's attention and keep them coming back for more. No, of course not, okay? Instead, Phil deferred back to his standard operating procedure, going over every negative thing ever said about him for the thousandth time in an almost two hour long video. One of the claims he makes in this very long video is that he had less haters now than he used to in proportion to how many genuine viewers he has. Phil was right, but he had no idea why this was and presumably chalked it up to trolls getting tired of his shtick and moving on to something else. Unbeknownst to him and many of the casual followers of the DSP phenomenon, the main group of DSP detractors was about to implode. Wings had Sean Ranklin, Chris Chan had Liquid Chris, and Darkside Phil had the Sons of Kojima. Sons of Kojima was a group dedicated to discussing, reacting to, and memeing on DSP. Their 
their name being an intentionally purposeful nod to Phil's complaints about Hideo Kojima's game design decisions in the Metal Gear game he was playing in the first This Is How You Don't Play episode. The first proper group with this purpose was the aforementioned Kojima World Order, who focused primarily on troll compilations. However, Sons of Kojima took it to the next level, and added their own commentary and spins on the contents to the DSP moments that they compiled. Even the original creator of the This Is How You Don't Play series, Evil AJ 2010, was a member. Quickly, the Sons of Kojima became the largest group of detractors online, with one man in its helm, Fred Fox. Wait, who's this? Fred Fox? Fred Fox? Fred Fox? Deriving his name from the ABGN clip you just saw, Fred sought to keep his real identity a close-kept secret, and tried to establish a strict code of conduct in other members of the SOC, and even the general DSP trolling community at large. Many former members cited the group as an enjoyable pastime that was gradually ruined by Fred, who took it significantly more serious than everybody else. His number one rule was that no one under any circumstance could profit off of DSP, supposedly because it would affect their capability of neutral and fair judgment of his actions. Anyone who attempted to monetize their DSP trolling begat a campaign of intimidation and sabotage from the Sons of Kojima, the most notorious example being with the then up-and-coming YouTuber, Ardnas. Ardnas was a rising star in the niche DSP detractor scene, uploading daily summaries of Phil's shenanigans. The one mistake she made was making money off of her work, something Fred and the SOK were quick to confront her with on Twitter when their content was used. The content in question was screenshots taken by Fred and images of DSP's content with an SOK watermark plastered on it. Ardnos claimed that her videos had ads placed on them by YouTube's copyright system against her will since they were DSP re-uploads. The incident split the detractor community as people were either subscribed to Fred's ethos or casuals who thought it was stupid to treat it with much more importance. And I would probably agree with the casuals. Ultimately, Ardnos got her account copyright struck into oblivion after her intro song, which was in multiple videos, was claimed in all of them. Ardnos and another former SOK member had a few exchanges about how Fred was worse than DSP. The particulars around who was responsible for the claims are very murky, but what matters was that this marked a tide change against Fred. For the roughly three years that the Sons of Kojima was around, it was involved in more internal drama than DSP himself. In 2015, Phil's main gaming channel, DSP Gaming, had been plagued by various copyright strikes over the use of fan art and pre-streams. Leaks from a former Sons of Kojima member, Kaz, revealed that it was an associate of the sock, Be Awesome One, who had not only created the fan art for Phil, but revoked permission for its use in his pre-streams, with the Sons of Kojima giving him the authorization. The Sons of Kojima had gone from idly compiling and reviewing Phil's content for fame and ridicule to actively seeking to destroy his career. One user, the King of Divas, saw Fred leading the group as the direct cause of everyone in it becoming distrustful of each other, but he was pushed out of the community and punished for his betrayal after the fact with a feature-length expose. His private messages, recorded calls, and personal information leaked, all for his non-adherence to the cult of Fred. Another user, Doper, made probably the best assessment of what the group was becoming in a twit longer. Let's be real here, Phil is not Hitler. He's an overweight, careerless 35-year-old man who spends his days walking from one end of his house to another while complaining about how hard his life is. I've seen way too many people act as if they're on some kind of mission to defeat DSP. Why? What's the end goal here? Get him off YouTube? Get his Patreon shut down? Why is this something that people would want? What exactly has Phil done to you personally that would justify that in your eyes? He blocked you? He banned you from a shitty ass forum? He called you names on the internet? Take a second look and think about how little that matters in the grand scheme of things. If he wants to run the forums into his own little safe space bubble with extreme hostility to newcomers or folks that don't kiss his ass, well, he has the right to do that since he's footing the bill for its costs. He has no career future, no friends, no stable income. He spends whatever free time he has going to hotels in his own area instead of actually seeing the world and gaining new experiences. His health and lifestyle is nothing short of abhorrent. We'll find out soon enough how badly he screwed his life up. There's no need to try and hasten that process, and neither should you feel happy happiness about it happening. This isn't good. It's sad. It's sad that a grown man is wasting his own life by acting like a petulant child crying about how everyone else is wrong and he's right while banning or blocking anyone who challenges him in any sort of way. If you want to laugh at how shitty his life is or what an asshole he's been, go ahead. But don't pretend you're on some kind of internet crusade against him. Is going on and on about Phil really getting anyone anywhere? Is bitching about him for 75% of a podcast really helping anyone? Phil isn't changing from anything being said on them, and neither are his airheaded fans going to stop pledging their money to him. What's there to even talk about at this point? Phil says something stupid about something he doesn't know anything about. Phil gets criticized and responds by blocking and then writing another wallow text. Phil whines about a video game not letting him win easily. At what point does it become obvious that it's just the same old boring crap from him? Fred did address this twit longer in the 96th episode of the SOK podcast, but removed it due to the backlash it received. 
Fred at this point wasn't just after DSP, but openly talked about his plans to dox DSP defenders, which more and more just meant anyone who wasn't as dedicated as he was to wrecking Phil's life. An audio leaked of him mocking his own friends from SOK, and it was becoming extremely clear their operations were nothing beyond a platform for Fred to deify himself and his unhealthy obsession with DSP. Some people claimed he'd spend over 19 hours a day in calls, attempting to manage the increasingly murky Sons of Kojima. The details of this are extensive and documented, but get to the point of redundancy and how ultimately irrelevant they are. Basically, everybody was under Fred's suspicion of being out to destroy SOK. This is what happens when you don't have better things in your life to worry about. When the previously mentioned Almighty Tevin had to pull out from participating in the podcast, Fred became paranoid about him to the point that he decided to release Tevin's docs. In an unexpected cameo, Mr. Medeker tried to intervene in the situation and give Fred some advice on how to avoid the implosion of his group and reputation. Medeker accurately concluded the group had become A-loggers, a term which originated with Chris Chan to describe haters who become so obsessive they end up significantly worse than the people they dislike. Beginning in late July of 2017, a series of leaks regarding the Sons of Kojima, and specifically his leader, Fred F began to circulate on forums. Fred continued his relentless campaign of enemy making in his own community, this time by persecuting a detractor called TXT for having a monetized Twitch emoji of DSP's face. He provided someone with information to use against TXT, who attempted to retaliate by doing the same to one of Fred's underlings before leaving the community. Surprisingly, this was the last straw that broke the camel's back and made people in Kiwi Farms turn against the SOK for good. Fred resented the whole situation and was still pushing for an expose to be made on TXT. But at this point, people within Sons of Kojima were turning against him. Soon, a massive prolonged leak began with the intent of exposing Fred, including recordings of him intimidating, blackmailing, and pitting members of SOK against one another. In a very strange turn of events, it turned out that in one of his random endeavors to terrorize anyone Fred suspected was a DSP fan, he used a voice changer to stalk and have cyber sex with an autistic man. If I had a dollar for every time a lolcow hater manipulated an autistic person into cyber relations via a fake voice, I'd have two dollars, which isn't that much, but it is kind of odd that it happened twice. Unsung Hero Bot decided to leak a barrage of incriminating conversations between Fred and another primary member of the Sons of Kojima. On the 6th of September 2016, a former member of the SOK, Renegade Operative, posted a video called Responding to the Sons of Kojima and Conspiracies, revealing that not only had Fred tried to dox TXT and Tevin, but even Renegade's ex-girlfriend after she decided to join him on a competing podcast. A day later, Fred's closest acquaintance from the Sons of Kojima also came out with his story, and given their proximity, this was one of the most damning accounts. Che abandoned the Sons of Kojima due to the group's toxic atmosphere, but in his absence, he had largely taken up caring for his then-girlfriend and fellow member of the SOK, Alice. Alice suffered from leukemia, and in 2016, she sadly passed away due to her illness. This is relevant because Fred thought her death was faked, and in scouring through a ton of obituary sites, he only succeeded in doxing Alice along with her parents. This obviously made Che very upset, and in the last episode of the SOK podcast, which was hosted by a member Fred was jealous of, no less, Che chimed in to air out years of abusive behavior from Fred. Null of the farms would confirm a massive amount of attention being brought to the thread as users flocked to see the collapse of the SOK, as the thread about it hit 23 pages in just three days. But, in the most cathartic moment of this entire ordeal, the man himself, Darkseid Phil, caught wind of the situation. He addressed it in a pretty long twit longer, saying the following. Tons of people are now messaging me to say that Sons of Kojima is being exposed for doing horrible things to me that they denied for years, and the like via a series of leaks. It was obvious the vast majority of the sh** was always them, as they are the only group who delve that deep into my personal stuff. I would not be surprised if they performed the vast majority of negative things against me, including the doxing, DDoS attacks, false copyright strikes, prank calls, pizza deliveries, signing up my emails to hundreds of spam mail sites, signing up my physical mail to dozens of catalogs and magazines I don't want, sending me feedback in the mail, yes, all that happened, and even swatting me. And remember, Leanna's father also got swatted. We knew nobody was safe. When it came time to start making preparations to attend Leanna's brother's wedding in late 2015, we came to the conclusion that, ultimately, if we attended, there would be a strongly increased chance that someone would try to f*** with us and ruin the event. That would have been incredibly messed up. Having someone else's once-in-a-lifetime event get ruined by a swatting, we all collectively agreed to stay home and not attend the event. What did Sons of Kojima do? Well, first they decided to find out the address and date of 
of the wedding. They, on their own, and without my mentioning to it for months, researched and found the event, and then spread that info all over the internet. They then decided to spin it that the reason we weren't attending was because I had forced Leanna to skip it so that I could stay home and play Fallout 4 to make money. So not only were they the reason we missed the wedding, they then turned their own vile actions into a way to make me look bad after the fact. It's mind-numbing, isn't it? It's stereotypical stalker behavior, and when it happens to celebrities, they get restraining orders. This is a textbook case of a bunch of sick-headed, mentally ill, yes, if you try to ruin someone's life you don't know, you are mentally ill, individuals trying to destroy someone they've never met and have zero personal relationship with. It's disgusting and disturbing. For those who are finally seeing the light, they need to look back over the last several years, all the they did to me since I moved to Washington, and seriously see if they can live with themselves. I feel bad even when I inadvertently hurt someone, but these people deliberately tried to destroy me for literally nothing. No logical reason. That's wrong on so many levels. My life is already destroyed in a lot of ways, and I'll probably never recover from the financial situation I'm in that they created. Therefore, why dwell on it? So please, don't keep contacting me with juicy new info, as I don't care. Just let me do my daily thing and be who I've always been since day one, and let's keep stuff positive moving forward. Everything else is just white noise that we can block out. While Phil is correct about many of the things said here, to blame the financial situation he's in on the Sons of Kojima takes a big chunk of credibility away from his twit longer. During the previously mentioned final episode of the SOK podcast, Null asked the present members if anyone had any knowledge of these swatting attempts, and they said it wasn't their doing. While Phil seemed to accurately assess his haters turned stalkers, it didn't mean that he was necessarily right in pinning his assessment to the members of SOK, many of which weren't half as deranged and deserving of that kind of framing as their leader, Fred, was. Speaking of Fred, he soon spoke out himself about the leaks. The things I've said and done in the past were disgusting, embarrassing, and inexcusable. I'm not going to make excuses or say that anyone else influenced me to do them. I take full responsibility for what I did and what went on in that group at the time. When I look at the pictures, I feel ashamed, not even just because they're public now, but because I acted that way. It's stuff I allowed myself to forget about and move on from that I have to now reflect on. One positive thing I can say is that the things leaking out from two years ago are not what the group is today. That is why none of the leaks are recent. A number of things have changed and the vibe is completely different. I want to thank you for your support and your friendship. I have no hard feelings. I can only blame myself. Whenever things like this happen, I try to learn from it. This is no different. We'll see what happens. For now, I'm going to focus on my friends and family. The reaction to Fred's apology was, at best, indifferent. At worst, people, including Almighty Tevin, who represented many of the members of the detractor community, saw it as generic and simply put, damage control, with no actual repentance to back it up. Speculations as to how the group would fare varied. Some thought there's no way it could survive in any shape and suggested that some of the members of SOK were gladly having Fred be the scapegoat for their misdeeds. However, others saw value in what the Sons of Kojima did, but thought it should be limited to the fun commentary part without any of the officializing and secret keeping Fred brought with him. Many people discussed whether Fred should be doxxed, which led others to suspect that a vicious cycle was at hand. By hating DSP obsessively, Fred became like him. In fact, he became worse than him. And so if people were to hate Fred obsessively, they'd also become like Fred, and so forth. Regardless, the leaks continued relentlessly, and after years of ridiculing lol cows, Fred became one himself, and received his very own thread on Kiwi Farms. With his detractors leaping headfirst into a shredder, Phil felt a burden lift from his back. Because of the void left by the Sons of Kojima's collapse, it meant that DSP had less judicious eyes trained on him at all times, and consequently, he knew he could get away with more stuff than usual. Besides things like his old condo still bleeding his wallet every month due to the real estate market in Connecticut apparently being on a continuous downturn, Phil admits not only to have taken on more credit card debt, but also loans and borrowing money from his parents to pay the cost of running his business. He says he doesn't talk about it because he doesn't want to bother people with his problems, but this is evidently not really the case since he has no problem in asking for money and constantly talking about his problems every day. More likely, he doesn't want to speak on where exactly that money is going because it will invite every dormant troll to scrutinize how financially irresponsible he actually is. Notwithstanding, he revealed that ever since his move to Washington, he'd been paying for a ridiculously expensive leased BMW. He talks about having been roped into it by the dealership so as not to pay penalty fees for the car he was previously leasing, but he explains this very poorly so it's difficult to even pick it apart. The most egregious part of the story is that when asked about why he didn't just get a used car, he tries to make it seem like it would somehow be more expensive and inconvenient than just getting the BMW, which is obviously impossible to be true. Just get a Civic, okay? But Phil's financial situation became exponentially worse when apparently someone, presumably one of his detractors, tipped off the state of Washington that Phil was an unregistered business operating in the area. Phil hadn't paid taxes for his business operations for the previous three years, and all of that was about to come down on his head at full speed. 
need. To pay off all of the back taxes Phil had accumulated, he did back-to-back -back live stream fundraisers on Christmas 2017 and February 2018. But despite having a minimum goal of two grand, Phil only raised a little over $300. Undeterred, he tried doing even more special events, such as starting the annual tradition of having the entire week of his birthday having celebratory streams. Coincidentally, his birthday is in April, right around the same time taxes are due in the US. During this time, he held an impromptu fundraiser, again to the tune of two grand, and this time, getting a little over $400. By this time, Phil promised to not bring up his taxes anymore due to the amount of ridicule he was getting from both his fans and haters. Later, Phil confirmed he managed to pay off his taxes for the state of Washington, with only his federal taxes remaining. Only problem is, his federal taxes amounted to $17,000. So during winter 2018, Phil ran four different fundraisers to scratch together some money to keep it afloat. Though his YouTube was simply doomed, as we've previously discussed, his Twitch account wasn't. During this period, he went from 517 subs to over 1,800, most of which is thanks to one user who gifted over 1,000 subs during his streams. The total amount donated through gifted subscriptions amounted to a little over five grand, which Phil got half of as his standard operating procedure on Twitch. This, plus Twitch bits, his Patreon money, what was left of the YouTube ad revenue, and the odd tip, actually made things look slightly hopeful. The only stain on this relatively positive moment was that Phil, despite his previous claims that he used to be an alcoholic, decided to spend the Christmas fundraiser of 2018 indulging in hefty amounts of alcohol, which prompted him to become noticeably more neurotic the drunker he got. Luckily, he managed to drift by without causing any major havoc online. Later, he announced that the grand total he needed to raise was actually 17 grand, as to cover the expenses for his tax attorney. April 2018 rolled around, and during the main event of birthday week, Phil managed to receive a total of $1,300 in tips. For the rest of the amount he owed, he made a deal with his parents. They would pay for his debts, but he would have to set out a 10-year plan to get his finances in order and keep them there. That was just one of many demands made by Phil's parents to teach him some fiscal responsibility. Another fundraiser was done in August of 2019, with the caveat that were Phil to get $1,000, a special positive announcement was going to be made. Once the goal was hit, it turned out he'd just gotten a cat. He alluded to a second goal reward, which was immediately hit when a user donated a whopping entire $1,000 in one tip, only for Phil to then explain that there was actually no second goal and that there'd been some miscommunication. It doesn't seem this was entirely malicious in nature, more so a manifestation of Phil's lack of communication skills. Soon after, Phil did an interview with fellow YouTuber The Quartering, though many felt that it fell short of expectations, since Quartering wasn't pursuing the more pressing questions and more so taking it easy on Phil over the course of it. The more success in getting people to donate Phil was having, the more he was seeing little bits of trouble start to surface again. In another situation, a longtime viewer and supporter of DSP, DJ Runo, donated the $20 that would be necessary for Phil to buy Untitled Goose Game, which Runo wanted to see him play. Phil thanks him very much for his generosity and eventually said he would buy it and play it the following week. However, the very next day, Phil took to his stream to say he didn't have the money to buy the game and was too poor to buy anything, asking for his viewers to donate him shop credits either for Nintendo or PSN. Unsurprisingly, this caused some commotion, and Runo tried to get his money back upon discovering that Phil wasn't going to play what he had gotten paid for. The more generous members of the chat deduced that since his PayPal was connected directly to his extremely overdrafted bank account, the money got swallowed up by Phil's debt before he could do anything with it. Confusion was only made even worse when Phil added Untitled Goose Game to his stream schedule for the month of October, following the end of his late stream at about 10 p.m. on the 7th of October. Later that same night, a post was made on Phil's forums titled, DSP pocketed my $20 for a game. It read, I need my money back, but he's banning everybody that's bringing it up. I'm just gonna go through PayPal and save the headache of lies I will be told by him. I've long knew about Phil's dishonesty, especially when it comes to money, but I donated anyways because I wanted to see him play the game. I won't be an idiot again. Phil did not take kindly to this thread. Changing the subject of it to, Entitled Moron tries to fraudulently report DSP for something that didn't happen. The thread edited title. He also posted in it himself saying, so you've made an ass of yourself. You never contacted me directly about this, but instead apparently decided to post stuff up here, talk to detractors, complain to Twitch, and act like a general drama filled dick. You're not the first and you won't be the last, but you really blew it this time. I was checking my emails an hour ago during my break between streams and saw that you'd sent me a message on PayPal. In the message you complained that you'd given me 20 bucks to buy a game and that I'd now said I wasn't going to buy it, but that if people still wanted me to play it, you'd have to send Nintendo credits and you didn't want to pay twice. So you were requesting your money back. I immediately returned your funds that I raised in tips on today's Borderlands 3 stream because that's all I have and apologize that this was the situation I'm in. All money I raise has to go to bills for important stuff, like keeping the electricity and internet on to say the least. So then I check my Twitter and the forums and I see this. Instead of actually talking to me like, man, you apparently are trying to report to Twitch using video evidence that was ripped from my streams by detractors. Guess what? That's not what a man or a fan does. You had a knee-jerk reaction instead of acting rationally and now everything you've done was in vain because one, you have your money back, 
Two, I haven't violated any rules or anything. Three, you just exposed yourself as a complete asshole. The best part is, I didn't go off when anyone asked about Untitled Goose Game. I didn't see anyone ask at all. I was angry that idiots kept asking for code vein slash astral chain after I'd repeatedly explained I cannot afford any games right now. The subject literally never came, but you're a gullible idiot who apparently believes what detractors say about me. Congrats, you're today's biggest idiot. So you only contribute to me to get what you want rather than actually caring about me as a person or a content creator. Well, you can keep your money then, and you can say goodbye because I certainly don't need entitled, toxic people trying to ruin my life and my business over 20 bucks because you can't talk to me like a respectful human. During a chill stream where he played Minecraft, Phil would spend over 30 minutes ranting about the situation, including insulting DJ Runo throughout for his insubordination. About eight hours after the creation of the original thread, the actual DJ Runo, as opposed to the imposter who made the first post about the situation, made a thread titled, WTF is even going on, wherein he said, just to clarify what actual happened, I was pissed about Phil because I sure felt cheated. Phil did refund me the money immediately. I did not report Phil to either PayPal or Twitch. I was hoping Phil would realize himself that the account on the forum at least was complete BS since it was just freshly made and if that doesn't shout fake, I don't know what does. I hope clearing this up with this forum account that exists for over four and a half years means something at least. If I thought Phil was as shit as the post I apparently made, why would I have watched him for over 10 years? Why would I cheer or donate frequently? Why would I be subscribed for over two years? I can understand Phil's reaction since basically 90% of his life was surrounded by detractor garbage, but come on, Phil. You must admit that you could have figured out yourself that the things I said slash did over the years doesn't add up to the stuff I apparently did slash said in the past six hours over $20. The real DJ Runo attached a print from his PayPal to prove it was actually him. Upon discovering he'd fallen for a strategically executed piece of bait from a troll, Phil apologized and assured Runo he wouldn't be banned anywhere. While this narrative was closed in a relatively satisfactory way, a bag of worms bigger than anything Phil had ever dealt with up until this point was about to open in a fantastic way. In November of 2019, the bank foreclosed Phil's Connecticut condo because he stopped paying for the mortgage, despite it still having a hundred grand or so left to pay. Phil did not address this publicly, most likely did not give trolls any ammo. However, when the info made it to his audience, as it always does, trolls began saying that Phil should cash out some of his WWE Champions account to pay his debt off. Now, what, what could they possibly mean by this? As early as late 2014, Phil made posts on his forum about his addiction to mobile games, such as, I usually don't play any or at all unless I was during a break in my Twitch stream, but I would pick it up again on breaks and in between streams, etc. Quite honestly, I have no idea how much money I've spent as I was alternating between 5 and 10 points frequently. I can tell you it had to be in the hundreds though, and I won't ever be doing that again. Over the course of time, he occasionally dropped on stream that he still played them, but if he had already spent hundreds of dollars on it back in 2014, how much money did he spend on it if you take into account the following years? Well, that's exactly what some of his detractors set out to discover. Upon finding an account in the game called They Call Me DSP, the same as Phil's Twitter handle, they began examining when that account was active and when Phil was tweeting. Lo and behold, the times matched up. Given, that's no damning piece of evidence, but it was something. Next up was ascertaining just how much money that account had spent in the game over the years, and the figure they came up with was a gruesome $38,976. <laughs> he spent just just shy of $40,000, which to put things in perspective, maybe for some younger viewers who don't know how much like things cost, 40 grand can be a down payment on a house. 40 grand is like a new BMW 3 Series, okay? This is serious money. And that's what he spent on a WWE mobile game. He tried to throw a little pity party over trolls annoying him about his absolute lack of concern with his money, but this time pity was something very difficult to have. Phil was having some serious financial and professional trouble since the very beginning of the decade. There was no justification at any period in time for him to have spent that much on a mobile game. That is, unless some of his detractors, like Tevin, were right all along, and Phil's claims of being poor were to some degree an act. And he wasn't as worried about his money as he appeared on streams. In perhaps one of the best and funniest trolling campaigns done on him for the entirety of his career, trolls began paying for cameos from pro wrestlers to call out Phil on his mobile gaming addiction. Hey, Phil Burnell, it's your Olympic hero, Kurt Angle. And detractors have your number, buddy. I've seen the bank leaks. Jasper, show me your phone. We all know the WWE Champion's addiction is getting worse. Oh, it's true. It's damn true. And Cat deserves more than Burger King. And by the way, I'm watching you. On top of a few other wrestling-related people and Ricky Berwick, we even get to see a familiar face chime in and give his very valuable two cents. You're filing for bankruptcy, but the only reason you're filing for bankruptcy is because you dumped $40,000 
into a game called WWE Champions. You stupid, dumb, ignorant mother. As you heard Mr. 445 himself say, as of January 2020, it was official. Phil declared bankruptcy due to being a whopping half a million dollars in debt. Later on in the month, he made a video addressing it, explaining that 130k of it came from 15 different credit cards he'd maxed out, along with a multitude of loans, some of which dated back to when he was still a professional Street Fighter player. The rest was mostly made up of the mortgages he was failing to pay. As stupid as someone needs to be to put themselves in a situation like this, Phil put his business degree to good use when he decided that he'd rather owe money to credit card companies than owe it to the IRS. However, he wasn't savvy enough to stop himself from lying on his bankruptcy filing. As detractors scoured through it, they were quickly met with the claim that Phil had no pets, personal electronics, or collectibles, all of which were verifiably false. Additionally, his business expenses listed him as spending up to $9,000 a month on his streaming, something that seems unlikely to say the least. The general public Public immediately deduced that Phil was writing off the money he gambled away on WWE champions as a business expense. This is why, when someone files for bankruptcy, that's followed by a hearing which trolls made sure to get access to. While we don't have video of it happening, the audio track is available online for anyone to peruse. During the hearing, Phil misconstrued a question about his purchase of a subscription to the WWE Network channel as if it were related to his purchases in WWE Champions. Soon, a detractor somehow managed to sneak their way in and pose as a creditor only to press Phil on his business expenses. The unnamed detractor asked for Phil to itemize his business expenses, meaning to lay them out one by one, which was something that Phil couldn't do without revealing his champion's addiction. However, the detractor was caught, as his claim to be a representative of Citibank was scrutinized. Later on, another troll joined the call and began playing clips of DSP playing Dark Souls, which amused everyone present. Why am I poisoned? Why am I toxic? <laughs> <laughs> I have to be happy. Despite attempts to derail Phil's defense, in May of 2020, Phil's bankruptcy went through, and $130,000 of his debt was defaulted as his credit plummeted into non-existence. While talking about his mangled credit score, he mentions that he's waiting until his credit gets better so that he can take out more loans. Again, what he means here is that he wants to transfer his debt from owing taxes to the federal government to owing money to creditors. While this is a smart thing to do in this situation, it's obvious that as soon as he gets his hands on surplus money, it's going to go to one of his addictions or needlessly expensive hobbies. And that's not even mentioning the fact that Phil is approaching his 40s right now, and eventually, he'll simply be too old to work and will effectively be thrown into the wood chipper that is the infinite debt cycle he locked himself into. At this point, Phil was entirely financially dependent on the donations of a group of people affectionately dubbed whales by his detractors. Just a few of DSP's watchers were responsible for most of the money donated to him. One man in particular, who went by King Tut, donated thousands by himself. Appearing suddenly in August 2017, Tut wasn't an old-time fan of DSP's meaning he wasn't one of these stragglers from pre lolcow DSP era who felt some parasocial affection for the man. So it's really hard to deduce why he decided out of nowhere to dump as much money as he did into Phil's black hole of debt. Being as much of a pay pig as Tut was had his benefits, so he could get away with pretty much anything, from being toxic in chat and insulting other viewers, all the way to trying to control Phil's streams altogether. While the pay pig privilege lasted for a good few months, eventually it did get to the point where the mods decided Tut had to go. Once he was banned, he became furious and demanded that Phil refund all the donations he'd ever made. This attempt at getting a refund was neglected by Phil, and Tut proceeded to file a fraud claim on PayPal to get his money back. The thing is, PayPal is so broken that this attempt actually posed a serious threat to Phil's entire operation. According to Phil, this was Tut's plan all along, and he was a secret attractor, so much so that he supposedly made appearances to DSP Hater Podcast after the chargeback, claiming that he got all of his money back and screwed Phil over. Phil's story, however, is that he successfully kept all the money and Tut's PayPal shenanigans floundered, but there's no way to know who's telling the truth in this situation. But while Tut's case is a clearer cut situation, there's another case where Phil took out some of his anger at one of his mods despite the latter not really deserving it. Swaggins, another one of DSP's whale followers, gave a tip to Phil on how to beat one of the bosses in the Resident Evil 2 remakes, only for Phil to misconstrue it, blame him, and lash out. As a result of this outburst, Swaggins proceeded to deliberately unban a detractor to spite Phil. In a stream of Sekiro that took place soon after, 
Swaggins found himself extremely annoyed when Phil relapsed back to his old ways of complaining about a game when it wasn't easy enough for him to play it successfully. But DSP, having none of it, said, I'm at a time in my life where I don't have time to deal with it. Swaggins is just mad that he told me to do something wrong during Resident Evil 2 and got blown up for it. Then that I plain don't like the combat in Sekiro, and he's so hurt by that. So he was a fair weather friend who wanted to mod when I agree with him, but as soon as there's a major disagreement, don't talk about it to me at all, but instead freak out and leave. That is kitty stuff, and I'm far beyond it to the point where I'm not having a second John Rambo situation, so he can just get out and stay out. That is literally what happened with Rambo all over again. Nope, I'm done with that crap. Swaggins also had a response in order. Stupid kitty stuff. As you say all the time, the world isn't black and white. To think it's just because of Sekiro is asinine. I've given so much, spent so much time trying to help moderation, only to be shown disrespect from Resident Evil 2 to now. All the excuses, the I did nothing wrong mentality and general toxicity have driven me away and I no longer wish to be a part of it. You say all the time that you're open to the opinions of others, but when it doesn't align with yours, you dismiss it and proceed to sh** all over it. Sekiro is an example of that. My time is valued elsewhere. Twitch should be a place to escape problems, not listen to someone else's. The amount of money talk has been such a turn off and will not help with long-term growth. Many have contacted me questioning whether or not you're even telling the truth at this point and generally say that they're tired of all the taxes talk. I'm talking about actual fans here, not detractors. I tell them that we can only take your word about it at the end of the day. Not much later, Swaggins lost his mod privileges and as yet another DSP fan died, a detractor was born and took another moderator with him. Eventually, Swaggins did return to DSP streams after a hiatus, but his hefty donations did not come back with him. Despite all of the financial troubles threatening his livelihood, Phil would soon find a new outlet, in a saga so perplexing and coincidental that it inadvertently ushered in a DSP renaissance, all thanks to a vest. While reacting to an old DSP video from October 2011, fans demanded that Phil wear the vest he was wearing in it, and he conceded. Upon a cursory investigation of his wardrobe, he found it and put it on. For a moment, fans and detractors alike united to be perplexed by the vest, to the point that when Phil wasn't wearing it during a stream, they asked where it was. Phil, seeing the success of the vest, along with his cowboy hat, stopped counting Twitch bits and tips towards his goals and instead encouraged users to donate directly to his PayPal, which allowed him to get the money instantly and without splitting the revenue with Twitch. He started monetizing the vest as much as he could, setting it as a reward if he hit a specific amount he wanted to get. The vest became a daily occurrence and people began counting how many days Phil reached his goal of $100 consecutively in a brief period dubbed the vest streak. This lasted for a strong 29 days. Unfortunately, disaster struck and Phil came down with an ear infection that made him unable to stream. To notify his fans, he said, All bad news. I've come down with a bad ear infection causing excruciating pain. I can't stream when it feels like I have a knife in my ear. I'll update everyone later today on how I'm doing. Sorry. I've had it for days but didn't say a word about it, hoping it would just go away. It did not. It got horribly worse. While this seems inoffensive on its face, the actual disaster came as a consequence of that ear infection. From responding mean-spiritedly to someone on Twitch that presumed that the ear infection had healed a day later, to being extremely defensive and gratuitously engaged engaging in back and forths on Twitter over the authenticity of this infection, Phil was giving people reason to doubt his whole story. Meanwhile, detractors were pointing out that hiding his ailments was something Phil had never done up until now, and that he continued to stream while wearing headphones without ever mentioning that he had an ear infection to his audience, despite having no reason to keep it a secret whatsoever. Regardless, despite the debate as to whether this lack of stream constituted a break in the vest streak, Phil continued to do the vest gimmick, eventually hitting a milestone of 73 days with the vest. This meant DSP earned at least $100 every day for over two months. On the 73rd, he miscalculated the tips by $9 and came dangerously close to not hitting the goal and breaking the streak. But lo and behold, it still stood. The vest streak bravely marched forward onto the 100-day mark, which Phil referred to as the Vestival. He also revealed that if another goal was hit, he would put on yet another hideous vest, this one a shiny silver, which he dubbed Platinum DSP. The streak raged on for another 50 days before, finally, DSP mentions that it was starting to become a lot harder to hit the tip skull and put on the accursed DSP vest. This was a few weeks after Phil was hit by PayPal with $800 worth of chargebacks. So as you can imagine, he got a little desperate. At this point, Phil's scheme was becoming irkingly transparent. There were times when the vest streak business overtook the stream entirely, with Phil coming close to guilt tripping his audience about the streak potentially ending. When it started out extremely positive, the vest was being absorbed into the general dark cloud of DSP's debt mongering and e-begging. More time goes by, and as DSP was approaching the 200 mark, an anonymous 
user would DMCA strike DSP's Twitch account, suspending him off the platform temporarily and pushing him onto YouTube. Eventually, he resolved the issue with Twitch and returned to celebrate day 200 of the streak. When the time came, Phil said that only now, with the vest aid, was he able to start sleeping soundly at night without worrying about his unpaid bills. From his point of view, everything was on a turnaround for him. By day 250, he starts talking about buying a PS5 with the money. No matter how much things seem to turn around, Phil continues to be Phil, this time wearing a valet uniform for some reason. It was only after 276 days that the streak came to an end, as Phil streamed himself playing Paper Mario in the Origami King. Despite preparing for this day for months, it wasn't easy on poor old Phil, who probably made 30 grand by playing video games with a vest on for 9 months. He becomes extremely upset at his audience for not keeping the streak alive, but ultimately he accepts that it's over. Cause there was a lot of support tonight, and it was mostly subs and cheers. So I don't know where, you know, why people did that, but that's gonna be, this is it. This is literally the end of the stream. I told you guys I couldn't go late tonight. So this vest streak is about to end. Any, unless we get a, 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 a tip right now at the very tail end of the stream, and there's no time for a vest, the stream is over. So unless we get something right now, this is it. However, what wasn't over was his e-begging, which made many of his viewers wonder, what did he do with that nearly 30 grand he made off of the vest streak? What happened to the vest streak money? It went to pay for stuff, genius. Bills, back taxes, like it paid for a tremendous amount of things around here. What do you think it did? <laughs> oh my god, people are so dumb. The nervousness and the vague pivot from bills and back taxes to a tremendous amount of things around here pretty much confirmed for much of his following that he didn't change even a bit in regards to how he handled his money. Phil's online inner circle would be rocked when a mod named Anonymous leaked the logs and chats of his private server uploaded onto YouTube in early 2021. Anonymous, who had worked alongside Phil for years, would concede it was time to join the dark side, removing himself as a moderator of Phil's Twitch midstream, but not without changing the title of the stream to DSP Doxed Pew Dubs before he did so as a parting shot. Phil Doxed PW Dubs? No, I didn't. I've never doxed anyone. As you heard, Phil claimed he had never doxed anyone. However, documented history tells quite a different story. Oh, by the way, I have your IP, I have your name, and I have your address. So, congratulations. You fucked up. Anonymous's leaks didn't do much damage to Phil's reputation, partly because it was already destroyed beyond repair, partly because there wasn't a lot of incriminating stuff in there that the detractors didn't already know about. Anonymous eventually revealed the reason he turned on Phil, saying, The greatest tactic in Phil's playbook is to characterize his critics as evil, malicious, and mentally ill trolls seeking attention. When he made me a moderator in October of 2017, I was a mod for one day before he removed me. A troll started insulting me for being gay, which I don't mind. They escalated it to mocking me for something that happened during my childhood, telling me that's why I'm gay, and called me a P-word. I timed them out for the rest of the stream. Phil was bombarded with emails complaining about me being a bad mod. He panicked, threw me under the bus, talked poorly about me behind my back to the troll, and removed me hastily. I emailed him and let him know what happened. His response was that he believed me fully, and I was still absolutely in the wrong. He reprimanded me, because he felt I had no reason to ever tell anyone that I was abused, and that I have to keep that to myself. He refused to restore my mod status, and gave me the same treatment he tried to give his whales. He tried to dangle it over my head. As it turns out, the mod Discord server was just the tip of the iceberg, as Anonymous released a plethora of information that was previously unknown. The user mentioned in the title that Mouse put on Phil's stream, probably along with many others, was asked by Phil to provide their personal information in order to get unbanned. I'm almost legally obliged to say, no matter how dedicated a troll you are, why on God's green earth would you give your personal information to anybody to get unbanned from a Twitch chat? I mean, unless you're a kid, I can't imagine that being a reasonable decision. Phil went directly to the private moderator Discord server and desperately tried to establish what had happened while he was live streaming. Because of the trolling today, I ventured onto the farms. Someone there has posted us impersonating at Anani, who insists it's not him. They are saying they are going to post definitive proof that is somehow going to incriminate me, but I haven't been that specific. They think it will be evidence that this Discord exists, although that doesn't actually prove anything. They are somehow convinced themselves, insanely, that as long as I'm using Discord in some capacity, that somehow everything they've made up about me in the last year and a half is true. They are hinging all this on the belief that I had a falling out with Ad 
Johnny based on his Twitch suspension. Which of course isn't true. They think I demodded and banned him from the channel, lol. So whoever this is, is apparently impersonating him to get me to think it's him and get rid of him. Soon it dawned on Phil that he was being fooled, and Mouse was indeed the leaker. He proceeded to confront him in the server. At Anani Mouse, are you still sitting on detractor streams talking about me? Because they are saying this is your YouTube handle that you just created, and I'd like to know what gives. Like, I'm giving you a huge benefit of the doubt here, but I'm hearing from every possible direction that you're actually trying to cause drama for me. They are also saying that both Anani Mouse and at King Goken talk to people behind the scenes and both confirm this Discord exists. Now that it matters, that leaked a year ago, but somehow they think it's news. Is it all an impersonation? And are we actually talking about this Discord server outside of here? I was under the impression we all want this thing kept secret, so they can't try to harass us. So why the hell is it becoming public knowledge? Phil tried to defend himself and explain that the information Dub sent to him was to prove that his account was the real one to ward off impersonators. That would be a convincing defense, were it not for the fact that Phil had previously bragged about having people's docs as multiple times. The one thing that did sap some of the steam off of Mouse's expose were the accusations of heinous stuff, meaning pedophilia and zoophilia. Even in the DSP video, I cannot seem to rid myself of these people. When asked why he was following zoo accounts, Mouse replied that he was doing it to see their tweets and befriend them, the same reason he follows everyone. He added, bruh, I'm a furry. We buy and sell exact replicas of animal genitalia. While I certainly don't F animals, I'm not above speaking with people who do. Members of the Kiwi Farms would not take kindly to the revelations regarding Anani Mouse's supposed predilections. Anani Mouse is into zoo stuff and like stuff like this. Make fun of this stuff what you lot will. I told you ages ago he should be told to F off. He's an adult and he's following this teenager that claims he wants to F animals. Are we really going to ignore this but poke fun at our Canadian coomer? Our side really isn't any better than Phil's. We are far worse. Reprobates like this adult man taking pictures of himself in a full diaper wanting to F fur babies and a zoophile are the people that detractors look up to. His attempts to apologize for what he describes as tantamounts to deliberately telling teens that zoophilia is okay weren't heeded by members who believed it totally insufficient for the extent of his actions. People pointed out that first he lied about knowingly interacting with minors about this kind of stuff on Twitter. Then when an example was brought up he acted like that was the only time it ever happened. The chips were stacking against the Naughty Mouse at a very fast rate, and today, he too has his own dedicated page on the Kiwi Farms. Eventually, Mouse reappeared to try and justify his actions, saying the following, I'm sorry for returning. The point of going away for the prior month was to reflect and start getting help. It's hard to make it clear how deeply I regret my actions without fixating on how it'll be perceived. Whether wording it the wrong way will sound disingenuous or make it sound like I'm downplaying everything or turning it into an emotionally manipulative pity party by oversharing my issues, etc. I'm absolutely disgusted with myself. It's pathetic trying to hang on like this. I'm sorry for everything I've been called out over. I should have done that first and foremost. This false confidence in my return is blatantly motivated by a desire to save face. I deleted my other accounts that deprived me of access to my terminally online life and forced me to get help because I knew I couldn't resist coming back to either chase clout or sh** and lol cows for cheap ego boosts. Clearly, you can't delete your account on Kiwi Farms. My only other option is changing my password to a randomized string and logging off forever. And so he did, as his account has been inactive since mid-2022. A 55-page leak of a conversation between Anani Mouse and a user called Pamper Chew came out in August of 2022 and quickly was archived by users seeking to preserve evidence of the two's abhorrent conversations with a vast quantity of screenshots provided. And I'll let you guess as to the quality of discourse in such a document. Meanwhile, despite having triumphantly served this upheaval, Phil was facing yet another threat to his livelihood. Twitch terminated his partnership and soon his entire account was set to be closed permanently. In an emergency video uploaded to YouTube, Phil demanded an apology from Twitch regarding their treatment of him, despite detractors pointing out that the partnership allowed Twitch to ban users for any reason at any time. Honestly, even though that may be the case, I still feel bad for Phil either way. If it was up to me, his Twitch would not be banned. The official reason was that Phil had allegedly said a hateful slur at one point during a stream. While Phil reacted to the partnership termination in a pretty angry way, bringing up US law as if it had any relevance to the situation, Twitch eventually decided to lift his channel suspension and acknowledge that he was wrongfully penalized. However, he had a grudge against Twitch and was already in the process of moving his operation over to YouTube. Funnily enough, in May of 2021, despite refuting the allegations of hateful language in his content, Phil almost certainly dropped the gamer word on accident during another stream. 
Later that year, over the course of a few weeks in September, hackers were able to socially engineer Bank of America to give them access to Phil's bank statements by using public info of his that was available, and the findings were intriguing to say the least. Over the course of the better part of two years, Phil spent approximately $190,485. Of that nearly $200,000, $3,000 went to alcohol, six grand was spent on restaurants and takeout, $11,000 on groceries, $26,000 on taxes, $33,000 on mortgage payments, and last but not least, $45,000 on microtransactions, not only including WWE champions, but PayPal and iTunes. It appears that the detractors, and most prominently Tevin, were right all along, and Phil aggressively played up his financial tightness to get more donations while he spent it on stupid garbage constantly. When Phil did address it, he didn't actually. He just claimed he suffered identity theft, which is actually true, and purposefully left the rest of the details as vague as he could, as to not raise attention to the glaring fact that perhaps the most damning piece of information on him ever was now public. Now comes the end of 2021, and Phil decides to make some changes to his content. First and foremost, the biggest change would be dropping the King of Hate moniker that had defined his career, appearing on merchandise, his own forums, and even his vlogging channel that he'd also retired on the 3rd of January in a video titled, Goodbye, This Channel Is Retired. Head to DSP Gaming and thank you for 10 awesome years of vlogging. Today, the channel does remain online, but only as an archive. However, Phil's attempts at rebranding would do nothing to curb the nearly two-decade legacy of the moniker, and more widely his online reputation. A critique that underlined this decision of rebranding was that Phil only did it after he got the attention of Moist Critical. Despite Charlie saying the same things many people had said before, that Phil guilt-tripped viewers over money and branded himself on begging, Phil took the opportunity to do a Boogie 2988 and performatively embrace the criticism to look better. Unfortunately, Phil then suffered another series of copyright strikes on his channel, DSP Gaming, after a detractor, Dayglow Hour, posed as a professional video editor, creating various intros and bumpers for Phil to use before his streams, only to then claim them once they were in enough uploads. Just a couple of weeks later, however, the strikes were cleared and his channel was back to its original state. Attempts to mess with Phil's income didn't stop there, however. In September of 2022, a user named MusicMouse7 tweeted to Stream Elements, the company who manages Phil's tips, linking them to a 13-year-old clip where DSP makes a pretty bold statement. But I hate the so began the chain of events that ultimately led to Phil's termination from Stream Elements. Phil took to Twitter to message the company, telling them his tips page became a 404 and asked if it's all related to mass reporting that took place regarding the TF2 incident. Following day, Phil opened up a link directly to PayPal for all stream donations, and now he has to manually manage his PayPal account and the donations sent, further unable to have automatic animation pop-ups. He also has to play these himself. Phil also instituted a brand new policy, adding the disclaimer, no refunds to his account. Despite attempts by trolls to report the account, Phil continues to use it to this day. In addition to taking this L, it seems DSP was breaking his promise to not play WWE champions anymore. The quality of the video is a little poor, but if you are familiar with the game, you can make out what is on Phil's phone. This is the brawl feature within the WWE Champions application game. The rest of Phil's 2022 wasn't anything new. He raged, e begged, and guilt tripped his audience over lack of donations while playing Elden Ring, called his audience bigoted when they made fun of a conspicuously feminine Halloween costume of Ken from Street Fighter, among other charismatic and lovable activities. The most recent major situation in Phil's career started with a podcast called Side Scrollers. This particular episode of the show starred online personality Adam Krigler and creator of the Screw Attack video game network, Craig Schizomis, otherwise known by his online pseudonym Stuttering Craig, and they'd be interviewing the one and only Philip Burnell. As he always does given the opportunity, Phil used this time to defend himself against the accusations of detractors, and like every previous instance of it, it didn't go that well. Some of Phil's shortcomings in the PR department were very familiar, such as him essentially admitting that he gave his viewers no value back for what they donated to him. However, some were novel. During the stream, the topic of WWE Champions came up, and Phil instantly became a nervous wreck. The interviewers seemed familiar with it and effectively pressed him on the topic, eventually circling in for the kill and telling Phil that if he wanted to, he could prove that the WWE Champions account that he had spent tens of thousands of dollars on the game wasn't his. All he had to do was show his account to a neutral third party that could verify his claims to fans and detractors alike. But Phil was not open to doing so and preferred to stick with his theory that a detractor of his spent that money just to frame him and incriminate him, which further solidified his guilt. You have my email and this is, this is a small ask. It's also a big ask. You can say whatever you want. Will you, and you can say no, and I'm totally fine with this, but just confidentially between us, will you send me a screenshot of your, of your account, of your WWE account? And just so I, I, I personally, I will not share, share your name to anybody, but just between us. 
Man, I have to think about and and vouch for you. Yeah, and and I I will vouch for you either way. I have to think about what kind of risk that. I don't want to say. Here's the thing, I I'll consider it, but I can't agree to it yet. I have to see what exactly what's the risk. You know. Another topic covered during the podcast was DSP's interactions with Keemstar, the official side character of every lol cow story, apparently. He just, he, he has to pop up. Keem had recently decided to move past Phil's drama with him over the coverage of the incident from a couple of years prior to make him an offer. A total of $50,000 to join the lol cow podcast alongside Wings of Redemption and Boogie2988. I got a brilliant idea. Why don't I take the three of you, put you on a podcast, we will call it the low call podcast. In an extremely unfortunate turn of events, Phil turned it down on principle and sought to make his thoughts clear on the matter during the side scrollers episode. This was a, some kind of like an in a big project he wanted to be involved in. I don't know exactly what. Let me explain. So he says, "Well, I don't want to talk about it in a DM. We got to have a phone call." I'm like, "Okay, that's reasonable, right? Let's have a phone call." Here's my number. Here's when to call me. I, I'm available at these times of the day. Okay. I wait, the call never comes. It's been like two days, the call never comes. Maybe he's not serious about it. I don't know. I don't know what's going on in this guy's head. All of a sudden, I'm on streams. He starts calling me when I'm on streams. I'm like, is he, I don't, you know, I don't know what's going on again. So I DM him after the fact. I'm like, hey, do you want to So basically, it's like, it's like stupid telephone phone tag. The guy won't even contact me to talk about what he wants to offer me when I'm available. Review Tech USA chimed in with a $50 donation to the stream saying, Phil, nobody cares about your history with Keemstar. Why are you above a 50k sign-on bonus for a podcast, but will ask for tips for groceries the next day? It makes no sense. Viewers began to speculate that the real reason was actually that Phil didn't need the money as much as he pretended he did. Eventually, Keem himself joined the podcast and the two went at it for an hour or so, getting very little resolved in the process. The aftermath of the stream resulted in only more derision between Phil and the members of the side scrollers. The day after after the now infamous interview, the group uploaded a discussion called Dark Side Phil Aftermath, where they went over how the DSP episode went. Due to them being honest about what they thought of Phil's responses to the more pressing questions such as the WWE Champions fiasco, the discussion prompted him to say they betrayed him and describe the podcast negatively. While he addressed the Aftermath video, he made the mistake of mentioning Keemstar in a negative light, which prompted Keem to chime in again. In a tweet, Keem reiterated that DSP was no longer being considered for the LOLCAL podcast due to his inability to answer important emails in a timely manner. In another instance, Keem said, I have set up interviews with DSP's family and friends. We're going to get to the bottom of this. Apparently, unlike him, they like money. Keep in mind, DSP totally unprovoked talks ill about me when I was retiring. I barely even knew him, and he doesn't know me. After that, he was hurting for money, so I offered him 50k for a podcast job, and he disrespected me again. After that, I had a peaceful chat with him on Side Scrollers Pod that settled the beef. 24 hours later, he was talking smack about me again. After that, he tried to steal my podcast idea. So I don't want to hear that I'm harassing him. I'm simply responding. When Keemstar announced he'd arranged interviews with members of Phil's family, DSP responded saying he didn't care since he had no contact with any of his family besides his parents. So Keem would get biased information from people only interested in the money. During one of his periodic lamentations, Phil mentions having developed severe trust issues and having an inability to have friends. But he blames trolls for this instead of blaming himself. It's hard for me to trust anyone. You wanna know why? Because so many people have kind of screwed me over over time. People who s swear to me. Don't worry, we're in it for the best of intentions. And you know, we're here to do this or that. And you know, then what happens, right? And it's like, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Well, fool me 70 seconds, seven times, right? On June 24th, 2023, DSP celebrated his 15th anniversary of being a content creator on YouTube. 15 years, 64,000 videos on the DSP gaming channel alone, countless hours of live streaming, half a lifetime's worth of subpar content. It's hard to even believe it got to this point. Unlike other lol cows who have one or two gigantic character flaws that are like genuinely just making them unfit for society in general, DSP is kind of a different beast. He has no particularly grievous offense towards other people. Instead, he has an unending series of small offenses he has no interest in taking accountability for. He's not extraordinary whatsoever, and that's precisely the appeal. Disliking him isn't a race, it's a f***ing marathon. His detractors will willingly sit through his content slop just to bask in how underwhelming it is. Every little self-serving lie, every e-bag, every insult to the audience, it adds up to the phenomenon known as pignosis, the inability to fully stop following what Phil is up to. 
DSP is like McDonald's, where you know you're getting a bland, kind of soggy experience, but every once in a while, you just you just find yourself coming back, okay? He's a low-skill, menial job worker who stumbled into being a professional content creator and got addicted to it, and no matter how much negative attention or debt his attachment to his online personality incurs him, he keeps on going. Phil is not destined to be an online personality. He doesn't have the talent, he doesn't put in the effort, he has no skills, and yet every single day, he's struggling against fate itself by not giving up. He's a let's player who's bad at games. Took three years after it was already the norm for him to start doing direct capture, and has never hired an editor in his life. He doesn't behave responsibly in the face of negative consequences, or his inability to manage his professional life whatsoever. He defaulted on over $100,000 worth of debt, debt that he took out on credit cards so that he could pay his taxes even though he knew his taxes were just going to continue to accrue, and he truly has no hope of paying them. But he simply does not stop. DSP is like Albert Camus's The Myth of Sisyphus. He doesn't have what it takes to perform his task, but he's going to continue trying regardless. The struggle itself toward being a content creator is enough to fill his heart for the time being. One must imagine that Phil is happy. Or at least, he thinks he's where he's supposed to be. 